Welcome to r slash am I the jerk, where Karen thinks that $200 is too low of a tip. Karen is furious that I only tipped her $200. Got my arm tattoo done recently. Was a little more expensive than I would have liked, but the artist is really good. It took her 20 hours. I did the math and she made $200 an hour. My arm is mostly black, so no other colors were used. It looks really good. I left a $200 tip. I thought that was fine. But my cousin, who recommended her, said that was a terrible tip and that the artist told her she was really upset about how cheap my tip was. Again, she made $200 an hour, which is a pretty good amount of money to me. She also is an independent artist and it's just her who does them. Did I stiff her? I'm new to tattoo etiquette. Not the jerk. Tip what you want. You paid her an agreed upon amount and then gave her an hour's more worth of money. My daughter is a tattoo artist and owns her own studio. As she says, tips are great, but her salary, cost of materials, rent, the whole nine yards is worked into the agreed upon price. $4,000 is an incredible amount of work and a huge amount for the average customer to pay. If your cousin feels so bad for her making $200 an hour, tell your cousin to pay the tip. It's awfully nice of you to tip at all. The artist is self-employed. You had a contract with an agreed upon rate. I don't see why you had to tip at all. Imagine a self-employed carpenter fixes you a new kitchen, one-man job, done in a day or two. Would you tip? Am I the jerk for telling my husband Happy Father's Day today because it felt like I was doing it all alone? This morning I woke up early to order myself coffee so he could take our son to pick it up and surprise me. Then they went to the grocery store and thoughtfully picked out my favorite breakfast and came home. My husband made half of the breakfast and then asked me to make the other half. No problem. He acknowledged that he was asking me to do the work and still taking credit for the benefit of our kids' experience and memories. It was no problem until he went upstairs to go to the bathroom. And after 45 minutes, I walked upstairs to check on him and he was asleep in our bed. He slept the entire afternoon. Later that day, I was doing the absolute mountain of dishes, my third load for the day, that's another story, and he asked me to make a grocery list. I asked if he could please make the list because I'm in the middle of doing the dishes and further tried to coax him by using Mother's Day in a playful way. I didn't really want to drop what I was doing to look in the fridge he was already standing right in front of to tell him what we needed for dinner. He knows what the ingredients are, he could easily look himself, but he insisted I help him. I was super frustrated, so I took a deep breath, washed and dried my hands, and then opened the fridge and started telling him what we need. He could sense my frustration and called me out on it. I explained that I was really hoping he could make a list himself just this once, because I was in the middle of doing the dishes. I explained that when I make a grocery list, I just look at what we have and write down what we don't have, and I didn't understand why he needed my help. He started talking over me to say if I had a problem making a grocery list with him, I should have just told him. I told him that I did communicate that with him. He doubled down and told me that I need to learn some patience. I smiled and said, Happy Father's Day, because it was the nicest thing I could think to say. That completely set him off. He went off on me, refused to get ingredients to make our dinner, bought dinner for only himself and our kids, and has been giving me the silent treatment for over an hour. He says I went too far. Am I the jerk? Edit. Thanks for all the feedback. I've been enjoying my self-brewed coffee this morning and taking in all your responses. I have a lot to look over and think about. I know divorce is the obvious answer. People who have commented are correct in saying that this incident is just representative of every other day, but magnified by the fact that Mother's Day was a particularly crappy day to choose to be particularly crappy. I feel like maybe I was the jerk for making the petty comment. I am in D and sometimes I have trouble picking up on if I did something wrong that I maybe didn't realize was wrong to say or do. I appreciate all of the anecdotes of your strength and ability to move forward after leaving an exhausting marriage. It is inspiring. Update. Since Sunday, I have not lifted a single finger for baby Sinclair, my internal nickname for him. Unless it directly impacts our kids, every time he requests my help or me to do something for him that he can do for himself, I just use my absolute sweetest voice let him know he doesn't need my help and I believe in his ability to complete the task himself. Then I smile and walk away. The third time I did this, he said I was making him uneasy. I could not help but laugh, which made him announce that he felt more uneasy. I know it wasn't kind, but I calmly told him that he is a pathetic human. I told him I'm sorry it has to be me, but someone in his life needs to tell him to grow up. I told him I care about him and I love him, 
but I will not tolerate being treated with disrespect even one more day. He said that I'm mistreating him. The audacity. I spared the divorce conversation for safety and because I have said it many times before that I want to leave and financially it's not possible right now. Update. I began to gray rock to throw off his cycle of attempting to rope me back into the argument from the other day. I have calmly listened to him gush over his love for our family and how much he loves and appreciates me and thinks I'm an amazing mom. He says he loves me, but all I hear in my head is his voice screaming that I'm a jerk. It all sounds so obviously disingenuous. I told him that his words mean literally nothing while his behavior is the same. It's like saying waffles have legs. It sounds unbelievable and if I don't see it with my own eyes, I'm not believing it. I told him regardless of if in the end we stay together or not, we need to go back to therapy as a duo and separately. I told him he needs to take steps today to move forward with therapy and treating his mental health appropriately. He agreed, but no evidence of walking waffles yet. I'm surprised at my ability to completely refuse to do anything he can do himself. I'm more surprised that he's actually doing the tasks himself. I've tried this before and he ultimately bullies me into doing the task. Not this time. He keeps complaining about his results in ways that are so juvenile and manipulative. Always leaving the impression that if I had just done it for him, it would have been done correctly. I just smile and tell him he did a good job with the task and tell him that it sounds like he needs more practice and eventually it will become second nature. I'm feeling his attempts to make me miserable, but it's rolling right off of me, at least for now. For those of you who have asked why I'm talking to the internet with this in the first place, I've been isolated from my circle for so long, my relationships no longer exist. I have limited family, period, and no family nearby. My mom has passed. My dad sucks. My siblings mostly suck. I have no friends. I work virtually and don't have friendships with my coworkers because we rarely socialize and have opportunities to bond. I don't have opportunities to interact with adults very often. Isn't that the beauty of the internet? Despite my logical brain, years of gaslighting along with my neurodivergence have made it sometimes feel impossible to trust my own judgment. Not the jerk. And he's a clown. For Father's Day, wake up and treat yourself and then leave him with the kids and responsibility. Tell him you wanted his gift to mirror the one you received for Mother's Day and that you're willing to make dinner for the kids, just like he did for you. Am I the jerk for telling my sister her Brady Bunch dream isn't helping her kids or her future stepkids? My sister was widowed four years ago, her fiancé five years ago. They've been together for two years and living together for eight months and their wedding is in July. They have kids from their late spouses. My sister's two are nine and seven. Her fiancé's three are ten, eight, and seven. My sister and her fiancé have talked a lot about being the perfect blended family and they already sought out advice on doing a step-parent adoption of each other's kids and asking about changing the last names of the kids so they all have the hyphenated family name. They're doing this when both admit freely the kids do not get along. The step-parents in the houses are disrespected by their stepkids on a daily basis. The relationship between biological parent and kid has become contentious. Just the other week, we were at my nephew's, brother's kid's, sixth birthday party, and it became a free-for-all with all the kids yelling at each other and them yelling at the adults, sister and her fiancé. They were so loud, a couple of neighbors checked to see if things were okay. It escalated until my nephew, who's nine, told his mom that he hated her and he hoped that she'd have the worst wedding ever. My sister's eight-year-old future stepdaughter told her dad that she wished it had been him who had passed instead of her mom. These were two very standout things said among many other anger-filled hurtful things. My sister and her fiancé decided to bring up the adoption and name changes to the kids the very next night. Oh, that sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? Which went disastrously bad. My niece, who's seven, called her paternal aunt and the aunt went off on my sister for daring to try and erase her brother from the kids' names and birth certificates and she told my sister that her late husband would be so disgusted by her and would never forgive her in a million years for this. She told her she hoped she had a miserable life with her new husband and looked forward to losing her kids in 10 years' time. My sister told me about this afterwards and she was upset. She was talking about the dream she had and how nothing was working the way she wanted it to. I told her that the Brady Bunch dream, and she mentioned the show before it was an ideal, wasn't helping her kids or her future stepkids. She said she just wanted all five kids to have two parents. I told her they already have that. They just each lost a parent, but they still have two technically and that didn't change. I said adding a third will be dependent on each kid and right now they aren't earning that by ignoring the kids' thoughts and feelings. 
She told me I didn't understand and wasn't being supportive. I told her she came to me and I listened and how she always told me to be honest with her and this was no different. She said I was being a jerk to her and should have just been happy for her and I really sucked. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. You did what you could. There are actual steps that sister and fiancé could take that might actually help their kids get to know one another and get along. It would also help with the transition after a hard time. She's just upset that things are not working the way she and her fiancé are choosing to do things. Not at all. The Brady Bunch was a fiction. It's a 54-year-old sitcom, not a guidebook for blended families. Family relationships can't be forced. It sounds like everyone involved could use therapy, and this wedding should be postponed. I, 29 female, made my stepfather, who's 50, an outsider at my wedding that he paid for. I need to make it up to him. I ruined the memory of the best day of my life because I was too blind to see what I was doing was hurting one of the most important people in my life. I got married two months ago to the love of my life and he finally opened my eyes to what I did. He showed me the perspective that I didn't understand. When I was five, my father just left, just disappeared without trace. He and my mom were already separated by that point, but he was still living with us. Three years later, my mom started dating Rob. Rob was quite a bit younger than she was. I believe she was 34 and he was 26. Today, he is very wealthy. He wasn't when he met my mom, and he treats my mother like a queen. Whenever she's around him, she looks like the happiest person in the world. My younger sister looks a lot like me and mom, but her personality is for sure a reflection of her dad, always telling jokes and being just a nice person all around, while me and my mom are more serious and cold. As I got older, Rob became more present in my life. He got married to my mom and she got pregnant, but it was still pretty weird seeing him as a father figure, mostly because people would assume he was my brother all the time. When I was in high school, I was dating this boy and he broke up with me at my friend's house. My mom was on a night shift and I had to ask Rob to pick me up. When he did, he comforted me, took me to go get ice cream, and when we got home, he told me something like this, without knowing what had happened. Whoever made you sad doesn't understand that you are the best girl in the world and it's their loss. Don't beat yourself up because other people are too stupid to see that. I just said to him, I wish you were my dad. He smiled and said that he wished that too and he could be if I wanted to. We left it at that. I never called him dad, but from that point forward, I saw him as a father, and I think he knows it. I finally reconnected with my biological father about a year ago. It happened because I got engaged. When I came to my mom's house one day, he was there, and I couldn't even recognize him. He was way thinner than he was when I was a kid. He struggled for years with depression and substances. My mom and Rob actually helped him get clean, and they even paid for his stay at a great rehabilitation center. They decided together that it was time for me to finally meet him again. I don't want to explore much on how this was, but all I have to say is that I'm glad to have him back in my life and I'm glad for being able to help him heal. He suffered a lot. He got lost, but now he's at least trying. Rob and my mother paid for everything at my wedding and everything was amazing. The church was beautiful. My husband looked amazing. The one mistake I made, I chose my biological father over Rob. I chose the man that abandoned me for over 20 years over the one that took me as his own and gave me everything he could when he didn't have to. I chose the man that broke my mother's heart over the one that saved her. I don't know why I did what I did. Looking back on it, I feel so stupid. My dad didn't deserve to walk me down the aisle. My dad didn't deserve to be in all the pictures with my mom and my husband's parents. It should have been Rob. I don't know. I think I was compensating for the lost time with my dad. Everything was still so fresh with him. I was helping him out. He talked to me every day. I felt like he deserved to be back in my life. When we decided who would give speeches, we had to cut some because it was just too many and me and my husband didn't really like the idea of hearing speeches for an hour and a half, so we decided for five people each. When I gave the list to my husband, he even asked, No Rob? And I said, Yeah, my mom is already doing one. The others I chose were two of my bridesmaids, my mom, my sister, she really pushed for it, and again, my dad. My husband said I should reconsider. He even thought of giving up one of his to put Rob in. I said it was fine. He didn't need to do that. My whole thinking when doing this was that Rob has my sister. He will have his moment. That was the only chance my dad had. But I went too far. I completely cut him out of the party, basically. If you look at the photos, it doesn't even look like he went. My mom looks like she is faking a smile in half the pictures. I don't have a single picture with him. He only appears in group pictures and some with my husband. 
I only realized all of this when I text Rob two days ago, asking him about a gift I'm giving my husband for his birthday. He answered, then asked about my car that is with a mechanic friend of his. He answered. Then I asked him something about my insurance. He did not answer. A little over an hour later, my mom called me. She just said, Do you have no shame? Do you not understand what you did? I just listened, and she told me not to talk to Rob for now. I was just so confused. I got home and told my husband, and he just said that he knows what she's referencing, but he will talk to her first. Later, he showed me the wedding photos. He went step by step on everything I have listed here. We talked calmly, and he broke it down for me. By the end, I was crying so much that I had a headache. What an inconsiderate idiot I am. He told me that he and my mom didn't tell me anything before the party because Rob asked them not to. He understood that it was important for me for my father to be a big part of this day, and when they protested, he said that they should not make me worry about these small things. I don't know what changed from before the party until now. My mom only tells me that he needs a bit of time and that he will talk to me soon. My husband keeps telling me that I made a mistake, but Rob will be understanding and will forgive me, and I know that he will. He 100% has already forgiven me. He probably felt something when I was texting him that day that broke him down. I don't know what I said to trigger him at that moment, but also it doesn't really matter. I did the real damage at the party, probably, since he appeared to be fine with everything else before it. It was not fine by any means. I have to make it up to him. I just don't know how. I guess I'm just writing this here because I'm a little lost. I'm too ashamed to talk about it with anyone else I know, apart from my mom and my husband. She doesn't tell me anything, and my husband keeps insisting that everything will be fine and for me not to worry too much about it. And he's probably right, but I just feel like me not worrying about this is being inconsiderate to Rob again. I have to worry. I just don't know what to do. I'm now at work, and the only thing I can think about is this. Nothing else matters to me right now. If someone has any kind of idea how I can make this up to him, I would appreciate it. Edit. Literally 40 minutes after I uploaded this, my mom texted me saying that Rob wants to speak to me tonight. OP on the situation of her insurance and Rob. OP. Actually, Rob does not pay for my insurance. He only helped me set it up. And this is not about money at all. I make more than enough money and my husband is also very well off. Rob and my mom paid for the wedding because they wanted to. They told me it would be their gift for me and they gave me the money to use it on the wedding. My husband's family gave us a sum to help pay for our new house. But your comment made me realize that this might be the problem. He might think I'm using him for money. That just breaks my heart. I don't want his money. I would happily take myself out of my mom's will and his, if he has me in it, which he probably does, if it means I can fix this. Also, he was not rich at all when he met my mom. He became successful after their marriage, just to clarify. OP on why she didn't plan the wedding photos ahead of time. OP. My plan was that I wanted spontaneous pictures, and the photographer had to be changed last minute. In my head, it worked out fine. What I wanted was to have the important pictures taken early. Bridesmaids, groomsmen, and family, and later on have just spontaneous pictures. It was something I was too stuck on, this notion of wasting time doing pictures, speeches, etc. But that was such dumb thinking. That's what weddings are for. At the end of the day, though, everything went great apart from this disastrous oversight of mine. You're almost 30, and you needed all of this pointed out to you? You made multiple conscious choices to exclude Rob for your wedding and only cared after you brought up an issue with your insurance, another thing he helped to pay for. At your age, you should know that choices have consequences. I'm not sure there's anything you can do to make up for the choices you made. Update My sister is mostly just sad, not really mad at me. Just said she understood my situation, but is still really sad after seeing her father taken for granted like that. My mother is the person the most upset with me at the moment. She's the only one that still does not talk to me. I mean, she does, but not really. And for the people saying my husband and mother were idiots for not talking to me before, they agree and they have told me this. My husband specifically. I'm not trying to shift blame here, just saying this for the people that talked about it. I was not going to post anything else on here. Not a fan of being called names and for people to keep saying that Rob should leave our family. Although I'm well aware that I deserve most of everything that was said about me. The comments about saying the apple doesn't fall far from the tree in regards to me and my biological father were the ones that hurt me the most as it's a fear of mine and the reason I don't drink much and don't make the other bad choices that he made. But seeing how there are other things that could make us more similar than I realized is really frightening. The day I posted here, mom told me that Rob wanted to speak to me at their house after work. I went and waited for Rob to arrive. When he did, my mom left us alone 
and he started off by saying that he was hurt by what I did at the wedding, that he knows he is not my father, and that he would never try to force that on me, but that he at least thought he had some sort of importance in my life, and seeing me just not give him any importance apart from talking to him when I need help with something made him realize that I do not view him as he thought I did. At this point, I was already crying so much that I couldn't even talk. I waited for him to finish, and when he did, I just told him basically what you all said in the post, that I messed up bad, that I was inconsiderate, that he is one of the most important people in my life, and that what I did was unforgivable. The only reason I'm posting it here is because of something during the conversation. He said something about my time at college, and I went, but that was because, and I stopped. He asked me, what, because of what? I just said, nothing, you're right, that was my fault, and I should have done better. He was pretty angry at this point and he started to smile and we talked about me taking responsibility for my actions. It's something I'm terrible at. It was an issue at my old job and since then I've been trying to do better at it but not very successfully. He asked what changed and I told him about the post. Multiple people in the comments said that I don't take responsibility and yes, they read right through me. I showed it to him and reading the post calmed him down. And no, he did not read the comments, just the ones I showed him. I would not let him see what some of you were saying about my mom. So yes, he told me if I was going to say something else to thank you people for calling me out for not taking responsibility. We talked about a lot of other things not related to the wedding. In the end, I told him there were just two things I wanted to say for him to take away from this conversation. I really did mean it when I was in high school and said that I wished he was my dad. Even now, with my biological dad in my life, I still feel that way. And the second thing is that I know that it will be hard for him to believe it right now because of what happened, but I will try to prove it to him for as long as it takes. For those interested, I've been going to a therapist with my biological father once every two weeks since he came back, but I think I need one for myself, so I'll try to make it happen soon. Am I the jerk for being snarky with my mother-in-law after she made rude comments about my name? My husband and I are expecting a baby. We have not announced the name or the gender of our baby yet. This will be announced after our baby is here. After we are positive, the name will be going on the birth certificate and when most people will hopefully know it's extra rude to make negative comments about names. We do expect negative thoughts. It feels like my in-laws, especially, have very weird ideas on names. The name Alexander is fine, but Alex or Alec are horrible. Jacob is a great name, but Joshua is awful. Ava is so sweet, but Ada is cruel to give to our kid. You get the idea. My husband's brother and his wife have a daughter called Lily, and the comments because they announced during the pregnancy were awful. The other element of all of this is my name. My name is unique and nature-related. Think ocean or lark. I love my name. I always have. I wear my name with pride as a 30-year-old woman. My mother-in-law can't stand my name. She has never said anything to me before now, but I heard her and father-in-law discuss my name and mother-in-law made very rude comments about my parents for naming me what they did. When my husband and I announced my pregnancy, mother-in-law asked about names, and my husband told her that we weren't going to reveal the name until after the birth. She asked enough times about this that my husband has told her to stop, has shushed her, and we also walk away sometimes. She told me it was worrying how quiet we are being, and please tell her we're not going with something as truly awful as my name. She told me she doesn't know what my parents were thinking or how much they resented me when I was being born, but that she did not want that for her grandkid. She told me a normal name was needed. She told me she knows I wear my name with so much pride and it better not give me ideas to think it's okay to name her grandbaby that way. I told her not to worry. She wouldn't have to worry about what her grandkid's name is because we wouldn't dare make her put up with us anymore and we should say goodbye now. She was horrified and made it clear that wasn't what she meant. I smiled at her sweetly and said I couldn't possibly ruin her life anymore by making her interact with someone whose name offends her so much. And I told her not to worry because we'd make sure the name we chose goes on the birth certificate before anyone finds out. My husband heard the last point of what I said and laughed and we left because forget that noise. Mother-in-law wasn't happy and she told me I responded like a jerk and now her worry is worse because she's so certain that this will be another lark or ocean type name. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Please name your baby something you both agree on. And make good on mother-in-law having zero access if you hear a peep about the name. She's being the jerk. Not the jerk. For the life of me, I can't understand full-grown adults that behave like this. Unless you think the kid is going to be named something like hashtag or pickle, there really isn't anything to get all worked up about. 
Ocean and Lark are both names that have been completely normalized now. Am I the jerk for throwing how much my husband makes in my brother's face after my brother insulted his career? I, 27 female, come from a family of white-collar people. My dad, who's 60, owns his own business, and my mom, who's 57, is a pediatric surgeon. My older brother, who's 30, is a lawyer and loves to boast about how much money he makes. He's always buying new watches and expensive suits. He also drives a Porsche and is engaged to who will be his third wife. I've always been more introverted than my brother, and I tend to fade into the background. I created and operate my own business and make a more than decent living. My husband is a master electrician, and he owns a very successful business. He makes more than three times what I do. We are a dink couple, double income, no kids. However, we keep our income very low key and don't spend money like my brother does. My parents are aware of how much my husband makes because we paid for their 35th wedding anniversary getaway and my dad saw the price tag. We were at Mother's Day on Sunday and both my brother and I bought nice things for our mother as gifts. He bought her jewelry and I got her a certificate for several hand massages at a spa near the hospital she works at. My mother thanked us and my brother decided that it would be a great time to brag about how much the necklace cost, looking at my husband and joking about how he could never afford to buy a necklace like the one he got my mother how my husband could never afford anything on an electrician's wage. He carried on like that until I had enough of him insulting my partner, who's worked harder than my brother to get to where he's at. I yelled at my brother to shut up and that my husband easily makes twice what he does and that he should sit down and be more respectful. Mother's Day is about mom, not you, were my exact words. After my brother left, soon after I snapped at him, I apologized to my mom and we went on to have a wonderful dinner where my mom told my husband embarrassing stories about me when I was little. My husband thanked me for standing up for him and my mom told me she had a lovely night while we were on the phone yesterday and told me she used some of the money on their certificate to get her wrists and fingers massaged after a 10-hour surgery. She told me she was very happy with my gift. My brother's fiancé sent me a tirade of texts blasting me for embarrassing him in front of our parents and calling me a jerk. I feel bad for causing drama but happy that I stood up for my husband. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. And your brother is an idiot for not realizing how much a master electrician can make. Your brother definitely is the jerk for saying the things to your husband that he did. He deserved to be called out. He owes everyone, especially your husband and mother, an apology. Not the jerk. Your brother embarrassed himself, really. It really gets me that people who work in white-collar jobs cannot even fathom just how much a master electrician or a plumber can make, also with no student debt. You want to put how much concrete in your Civic? Many years ago, I worked in a locally run store that sold a bit of everything. I was the low-paid teenager that carried heavy things to people's vehicles. While working one day, I get called over the radio that a customer needed 12 bags of concrete, 80 pounds each. I was expecting to see a pickup truck or something similar backed up to our loading area. Instead, I saw a small Honda Civic there waiting for me. Thinking it was a mistake, I asked the driver to relocate momentarily as I had someone coming to pick up multiple bags of concrete. Imagine my surprise when they told me they were the customer I was waiting for. I asked the customer how much they wanted to take in each trip as I believed the nearly 1,000 pounds of concrete might be too much for such a small vehicle to handle safely. The customer became aggravated and insisted that they were taking it all at once. I quickly ran this past the store owner to make sure I wouldn't be held liable for any damages. I ran back, apologized to the customer, and began loading the bags. As I loaded everything up, the customer made several quips about how the customer is always right and that I was too young and naive to understand that vehicles are engineered with a margin of safety. It quickly became apparent that there was no play left in the suspension, but at this point, I just stopped questioning things. I couldn't fit all of the bags in the trunk, so the customer cleared their back seat and I loaded that up as well. Upon leaving the loading area, you could clearly hear things rubbing. As the car went to exit the parking lot, it passed over the elevation change between the lot and the road and there was a loud pop of something breaking, followed by scraping. I could see that the driver was irate in the car. After a moment, they got out, looked around and under their car. The guy sheepishly asked for my cell phone because his battery had died and he needed to make a few phone calls. A short time later, a tow truck came to remove the car and the guy waited in our lot for nearly an hour until his wife could come pick him up. Karen gets evicted without a warning. I've evicted multiple guests from my property, but never had an issue with a noise complaint get to this point until tonight. Our cast is me, nice lady, 
and the Mega Karen. Phone rings. Me. Front desk. This is Eat More Unicorns. How can I help you? Nice lady. Hi, sorry to bother you, but we're trying to sleep, and the people next to us are talking really loud. Could you ask them to quiet down? Me. Of course. Just give me a few minutes and I'll take care of it. If they don't quiet down within 15 minutes, call me back and let me know. Nice lady. Thank you. She hangs up. I go down the hall and listen to see who it is, then go back to the front desk to make the call. Management doesn't want us knocking on doors at night. I call the room. Karen. Hello? Me. Hi, this is the front desk. I'm sorry to bother you, but I got a noise complaint and was just calling to ask you to... She interrupts me. Ugh, seriously? She hangs up. Well, forget me then, right? 20 minutes later. Nice lady. Hi, sorry to bother you again, but they're still being really loud. Me. I'm sorry about that. I'll ask them again. Nice lady. Thank you. She hangs up. I call the room again. Karen. Hello? Me. Hi, this is the front desk. I. She interrupts me again. If you call again, I'm going to come down to the desk and kick your butt. She hangs up. Oh, is that a threat? Guess it's time to call the police. I call the police and tell them what happened. They send someone down. Officer gets here. I tell them her room number. First floor, right down the hall, so I can hear some of the things they're saying. The officers knock on the door and start talking to her. I'm not 100% sure what they said at that point, but I do hear her say, She's full of crap. And, Why do I have to leave? Eventually, she agrees to leave and comes storming into the lobby with all of her stuff, saying, You better not try to charge me for the night. She's been in-house for seven hours already. She's getting charged. I smile and say that she can call the manager tomorrow and ask him about getting her money back. I already know that's not going to happen. Officers escort her out the door. I decide to call my manager and let him know what's happening. Manager laughs and confirms she won't be getting a refund and he'll deal with her tomorrow when she calls. I mean, technically she had warnings about quieting down, but I didn't warn her I was going to evict her. That's the first and hopefully last time I've ever evicted someone without telling them you have 10 minutes to pack your stuff and leave before I call the police. Speaking of hotels, what's your favorite hotel to stay at? Please let us know. I prefer Motel 6. They leave the lights on for you. Teacher gets exactly what she asked for when I turn on my camera. Background. I am currently in high school and we have Zoom meetings in almost every class every day for online school. I dislike it especially having to have our cameras on. I get super self-conscious that anyone in the class could be looking at me and I wouldn't know. A user in the comments pointed out that it could be paranoia, which I think it is. Being paranoid is the best way to describe the feeling. My English teacher, who we will call Miss Stevens, is super extroverted and loves to see her students. This is all fine and dandy, but she obsesses over it. She yells at kids all the time for not having their cameras on as she wants to see you participating in the class. I personally don't think that students should have to invite their class into their personal life for a grade. After a while, she got fed up with people ignoring her demands, so she started docking points for the day's assignment if you didn't have your camera on. I joined a meeting recently without my camera on, as per usual, and I began working on the assignment. She stayed completely silent about my camera for some reason, which I loved for that class. I could work in peace. Later that evening, I get a notification on my phone that I got a 75 on today's assignment. This was terrible for me because it took my grade in her class down to a B and I lost my 4.0 GPA. I emailed Miss Stevens and asked if it was a mistake or anything. She said something along the lines of, I need to see you participating in the class and because I couldn't, I felt it was necessary to deduct 25% from your grade. I don't have the email right in front of me at the moment. I told her that I didn't feel comfortable turning my camera on, which I feel is totally reasonable. She gave me a hard no and said, Nobody is watching you in class. They're watching me because I am the teacher. You will get used to it eventually. I was upset. All I want is a little bit of privacy. Sure, not all of the kids stare, but we all have moments where we get lost staring. I decided I would turn my camera on, but I wanted her to regret it. I downloaded a super glitchy, flashy, bright, and disgusting glitch effect that I could put over my camera using a plugin for OBS that I found online. It lets you use OBS as your camera so I could add whatever I wanted. The next day I show up for the meeting and turn my camera on. 
A few minutes into the lesson, I turn on the glitch effect and lower the frame rate of my camera to make it look like I was just lagging. Miss Stevens asked what was happening, so I replied that I think my Wi-Fi is being slow or something. She moved on with the lesson, but you could tell that she was starting to get annoyed by this constant flashing on her screen while she was talking. There aren't enough kids in the class for her to simply put me on another page, and I don't think she knows how to turn my camera off herself. I began to enjoy seeing her reaction, so after I finished my assignment, I started messing around with it a little. I started flashing random things on my camera, like pictures of Shrek, memes, whatever came to my mind pretty much. She pulled me aside after class. Keep in mind, my camera still had the glitch effect going on, and she lectured me on how having my camera on like that was distracting. Even though I finished my assignment after only 15 minutes or so, I just said, you wanted me to turn my camera on, so I did. You never told me what I had to have on my camera. She kind of rolled her eyes a little and just gave in. I don't have to have my camera on in that class anymore. She also apparently emailed my parents about me being distracting, and when I showed the plug-in to my parents, they found it hilarious and didn't care all that much. I wasn't distracting any of the other students, and I was already done. No problems here. Edit. A lot of people in the comments are asking if my grade got fixed, and if I contacted the principal. Both of these things happened, and I am sure my teacher got a talking to from the principal. My grade is fixed, and I'm back to having all A's. Well, what do you think? Should students have to turn on their cameras if the teachers demand it or not? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for stealing my sister's inheritance? My parents are both living, healthy, and relatively young, both in their 40s, but they recently redrafted their will due to everything going on. My sister is 25, living at home, and I'm 20, living in an apartment, so honestly, I feel this point is moot. However, my sister is extremely upset with me. Since my parents redrafted their wills, my mother decided to sit down with my sister and me separately to discuss things. My sister wanted everything to be split down the middle, but did not want to liquidate the property. She was wanting my mother to allow us to buy each other out, so whoever had the funds would be able to have our family farm. My mother did not agree with this prospect due to the inability for us to have the assets to purchase such a property, especially at this age. She sat down with me separately and I told her I'd rather have my sister be given all the liquid assets if I was able to keep the farm. My mother agreed with this since it was fair and allowed for the land to stay in the family. When talking to both of my parents, they wanted to give me most of the sentimental items while my sister got first pick of particular family heirlooms. While we both are getting items and they are relatively similar value-wise, financially split down the middle more or less, most of mine have family ties to them as well. My parents know my sister is less responsible with money, has difficulty keeping a job, and does not treat her or others' property well due to some of her medical history. This belief supported their reasoning. Well, my parents told my sister the new arrangement so it will not come as a surprise and she is utterly furious that I coerced my parents into giving me the land and more family heirlooms. When she read the will, the anger doubled because it was listed in the event they passed she would have six months to move out of the family home. Now she's claiming I not only stole her inheritance, but I am rendering her essentially homeless in the instance of our parents passing. My sister and I have always been civil, but she's been coming after me, calling me all sorts of names and telling people that I have stolen her rightful inheritance. Am I the jerk for negotiating inheritance with my parents? I honestly feel somewhat guilty for pushing her to this point, especially during Christmas time when we're supposed to spend time together. Edit. Some people have been asking if the assets are similar in value, which financially they are. I have lots of sentimental value for the farm, hence why I would rather have the property than money. Edit 2. Someone asked about the disabilities, so I'll copy that response here. My sister has bipolar depression and memory loss due to adolescent epilepsy. I also have PTSD, ADHD, cerebral palsy, and other neurological conditions that are progressing. Therefore, I do not take the difficulties we have into a high account in this particular situation since our disabilities do not directly correlate with the situation. My parents have already set up a system for their passing that would provide her long-term insurance and have a plan in place. The money she would be receiving would be approximately $5,000 in addition to her monthly SSI my mother has worked to get her. That would also be after the initial sum of money unbeknownst to me and life insurance. This money would be dispersed for more or less the rest of her life in the event they pass. In addition, my sister has been able to live on her own but has since came back home due to being unable to manage money well and the inability to stay in a job. 
My disability makes me unable to live independently, but my boyfriend is able to assist me in that regard while I work towards raising money for a service dog. Curse insurance. I didn't really find this relevant, but I guess it's important. Well, who do you agree with? OP or her sister? Please let us know. Entitled driver wrecks his brand new Dodge Charger, injures and then blames me, a pedestrian, for his wreck. So, backstory. I work for a subcontracting company that does really niche IT work for various municipal governments and my truck is loaded with equipment for computer repair and road work. Like I said, it's niche, but this becomes important later. As such, I currently have a two hour commute and while I do use the interstate during the day, I usually head home closer to midnight and prefer to take the state highways and back roads due to the lower speed limits. So now for the cast. We have me, OP, and we've got Brad, the entitled driver, fake name. We've got Renee, my fiance and coworker, fake name. We've got nice girlfriend, Brad's female companion. And we've got Chad, Brad's absolutely chill father, fake name. Now for the story. So as Renee and I were driving home tonight, we had noticed that a large rotted poplar tree had become uprooted and fallen into the road, covering both lanes. Normally, I would have called local officials and then either waited for the tree to be removed or simply waited for them to arrive and then take a different route. Unfortunately, I had no cell reception in this area and rerouting would have added an extra hour to my already long commute. As such, I figured I'd try to use my demolition hammer, the best thing available to me, to try and at least weaken it until someone came by with cell reception that we could flag down and get to call local authorities. So I turned on our hazards turned on our beacon, and Renee and I both put on our reflective vests and hard hats with built-in lamps. While Renee brought the tools over to the tree, I began grabbing the traffic cones to block off the road. Enter Brad. As I finished setting up the cones behind the truck, Renee began handing me the cones to put in front of the fallen tree. No sooner had I begun reaching for them when we heard the roar of a brand new Sunrise Orange Dodge Charger RT flying up the back road with a 30 mile per hour speed limit at highway speeds. I ran in front of the fallen tree, shining my flashlight on the already well illuminated tree and tried to flag down the charger. It was no use. He never even hit the brakes. I dove out of the way at the last second as the charger plowed into the tree, turning it into a horizontal fulcrum and me into a baseball as the tree struck my shoulder and launched me about 10 feet. I got up, extreme pain throughout my left side and unable to raise my arm up. Adrenaline coursing through me, I ran, um, hobbled quickly, to the remains of the poor obliterated charger, now smoking and leaking fluids all over the road. Miraculously, Brad and his nice girlfriend, both about my age, early 20s, got out and were completely unharmed, though understandably shaken. Renee, who miraculously found the one spot with coverage, called emergency services and nice girlfriend called Chad. That's when I heard it. Brad. Oh God, my car. How could this happen? Why does this always happen to me? What would... And that was when he looked at me, looked at the clearly uprooted tree and proceeded to have a unique reaction. One that I never thought really ever happened. One that sounded like... <coughs> me, thinking maybe he's injured too. Dude, are you okay? Brad. No, idiot. Because of you, my car is completely totaled. What kind of moron cuts down a tree in the middle of the road? Me. Actually, the tree was already here. We only got here maybe two or three- BS! You blinded me with that flashing strobe light. Pointing at the yellow hazard beacon on my truck, which I've used for years. Nice girlfriend. Actually, I think that- Brad. Shut up, all of you. I'm gonna sue you for failing to illuminate the tree properly. This is irrelevant. Me, trying to be nice. Well, actually, that's- If you open your mouth one more time, I'm gonna- Renee, in all of her four and a half foot glory. Enough! It's not his fault that you clearly acquired your driver's license in a happy meal. That tree is very well illuminated. You clearly weren't paying any attention, and you hurt him. Look at him, he's limping, idiot. You're the one who ought to be apologizing for that stunt you pulled and the mess you made. Silence. Deathly, unnerving silence as Brad stood slack-jawed and making a strange choral noise. Suddenly, Brad goes on an absolute rampage, kicking and throwing my cones, tools, and various other items from and around my truck into the forest and off the road's 15-foot embankment. I wish I could tell you more, but it was about that time that Chad arrived along with first responders. We gave statements and I spent the rest of the time being checked out by EMS. 
I'll update you tomorrow after his insurance company calls me. Am I the jerk for throwing away a whole pot of chili out of spite? I'm extremely sensitive to the taste of salt. Nothing will happen to me health-wise if I do eat a lot, but I absolutely cannot stand it and salted food is inedible to me. My boyfriend, on the other hand, is a salt fiend. He adds extra salt to everything, which is fine. Everybody has their own taste palette. I don't care what he does with his own food. I got up yesterday and decided to do chili in the crock pot. 5 p.m. rolls around, chili is done. We bowl up for dinner. I'm not very hungry, so I just make a tiny bowl with the plan to go back later. I made 10 quarts with the idea of leftovers for at least two days. I go back a few hours later, make another small bowl, and shrivel into a raisin upon taking the first bite. He didn't just salt his bowl, he salted the entire pot. Now, I'm aware that 99% of the population would probably have to season their bowl. I expect people to. When I have someone over to eat, I tell them I don't use much salt and direct them to the shaker so they can do up their own portion however they like it. But I do expect people to have some consideration for others eating and limit it to their own plate. This isn't the first time he's done this and we've talked about it before. He swears he won't do it again, but it's a 50-50 chance next time we'll eat, he'll salt the main dish before putting it on his plate, instead of just salting what's on his plate. It ruins leftovers for me, which upsets me because I'm the sole buyer of groceries and I usually cook in bulk. I didn't say anything, I just dumped my bowl. I was upset, feeling disrespected and uncared for, and in the heat of the moment, I dumped the rest of the pot. My thought process was, if I can't eat, neither can he. He has a habit of getting up at around 1 a.m. and digging into leftovers, so like clockwork he goes downstairs, digs around in the fridge, then stomps back up to our room and asks, where the heck the chili went? I told him I threw it out because it was inedible and he lost it about wasting food, saying it's not his fault I have no sense of taste and didn't think I wanted any more. Ten quarts of chili and he thought nine of it was solely his apparently. This is the first time I've actually thrown out basically a whole dish. Normally, I just complain to him about it, remind him to stop doing it and move on. This time, I just snapped, I guess. I'm tired of only getting to eat a tiny portion of food that I pay for and cook. It's costing me money because I'm having to make separate food for myself when there's perfectly good leftovers I can't touch. It seems like a dumb thing to fight over, and now that I've thought about it, I wonder if I did overreact. I'm still upset, but it does feel petty and wasteful. I vented in my group chat, and it's been a mix of your food, your choice, and it's just salt, get over it. Am I the jerk for throwing it away purely out of spite? Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk for what she did or not? Please let us know. Desperate times call for desperate measures, but can we please get some Fs in the comments for that chili? Chad, are you slow or something? Me, yes, actually I am. Quick preface, I was in an accident a little over a year ago. This left me some brain damage, nerve damage, etc. Throughout many days, I have episodes where I get disoriented, forget where I am, what I'm doing, what's going on around me. I used to do heavy manual labor, but I'm now working at a well-known department store with aprons of a certain citrus variety. A couple days ago, I was shopping at our store with a friend in a black and orange hooded flannel. I love flannels and have this exact one in multiple colors, but this one was the only clean one at the time. I'm approached by a middle-aged man carrying a small metal piece related to light bulbs. Well, at this certain point of our trip, I was starting to have an episode. My body got really hot, I zoned out quite a bit, and was just overall not there 100%. He asks me where he can find a replacement for this piece, and I point toward the hardware department even though I was off duty, not in uniform, and clearly shopping for myself. Where I pointed seemed to confuse him, and he muttered something under his breath while giving a really puzzled look, but goes anyway. We go to the water fountains near the bathrooms in the back so I can get some fluids in my system and chill out a bit. When we continue shopping a few minutes later, who passes us? None other than puzzled looking man complaining about stupid employees and blah blah blah. Oh no, it's about to go down. At first, he stops a few feet away from me looking around, clearly searching for the stupid guy who sent him over to the hardware department until he realizes I'm standing right by him. He locks eyes with me and the conversation goes as followed. Chad, are you the one who sent me all over the store looking like an idiot? Me, oh, I'm sorry. I was confused by what you showed me. Chad, it's a blank. I forget the exact name of the piece. Why the heck would you send me to the hardware aisle? Are you slow or something? Is this one of those programs? Me, while customers are starting to notice the commotion, 
I'm sorry, man. I'm not even working right now. I'm just trying to enjoy my day off. I didn't mean to send you to the wrong place. At this point, another employee walks up and tries to defuse the situation, seeing me, their subpar mental capacity coworker, and a fuming customer in a situation. Coworker to Chad. What seems to be the problem? Chad. Thank God. Are you slow too? Or do you think you can show me where I can find this? Gestures to the small piece in his hand. Me. Sir, I understand you can't know this, but I am a bit slow at times. I have fairly severe brain damage and also, as I said before, it's my day off. Gesturing at coworker's apron. When I say this guy turned white as a ghost, I kid you not, white as a ghost. Mouth agape, it was glorious. After this, everything dies down a bit and I bask in the small win. I know this isn't as eventful as most stories and will most likely get buried or taken down as I technically do work here. But nonetheless, this subreddit is the first place I thought of as it all unfolded. One last note, sympathy is never something I seek. I'm very high functioning and work with someone who truly has a rough condition so I don't take advantage of it. But I couldn't stand this man talking to anyone like this. I just imagined him saying it to someone much more emotional than I and it broke my heart. Am I the jerk for allowing my cats to be cats? To give a little background, I just moved into a pet friendly apartment two days ago. I have two cats, one is five pounds and the other is eight pounds. This apartment is on the second floor and all of the floors are hard wood. There's also no verbiage on the lease requiring tenants to put down carpets in these units. When I was looking at this apartment, the landlord stated that the downstairs tenant can be a bit sensitive to noise. At the time, I thought he was being a little extreme, but I've since learned that's not the case. On the day I moved in, the neighbor from downstairs decided to introduce himself. During his introduction, he mentioned that in the past, he's had a lot of issues with noise from the unit I'm moving into and that he hoped we'd be good upstairs neighbors. I told him that I'm generally a quiet person and that noise shouldn't be an issue. Well, today when I got home from work, I found a notice on my apartment door from management stating that I was reported for having dogs in the apartment, which is against the lease, and that if I don't correct the situation immediately, I'll be evicted. I find this shocking because one, I don't have dogs, and two, the landlord knows I have two cats. I immediately sent an email to my landlord stating that I don't have dogs and that I believe he put the notice on the wrong unit. I'm still waiting for his response. Cats being cats, they tend to get the zoomies every now and then, which basically amounts to them running up and down the hall and jumping up and down from the couches. Along with this, there's also jumping from the couches to the cat tree to the floor during the non-zoomy time and playing with their toys, which have bells and such, but should not be audible from the lower floor. To me, this is all reasonable noise considering this is a pet-friendly apartment. It's not like I have two obese cats either. They're both under 10 pounds and I keep their claws trimmed to limit the clacking and to save my furniture. Yesterday, before I received this complaint, I bought a 16-foot runner to go down the hallway so that the cats don't make as much noise while running. But regardless of the carpet, which will arrive next week, I feel that he's being unreasonable and has a warped perspective on what apartment living is like, especially for someone on the first floor. There will always be noise, and that's just a fact. I shouldn't have to feel like I'm walking on eggshells in my own apartment. Am I the jerk? Well, who do you agree with? OP or her neighbor? Please let us know. I think we need to get some pro revenge on this guy. Who's with me? A guy thinks he owns me now because he has money. This happened almost four months ago. I was dealing with a really bad breakup still, and of course, a lot of guys started to message me, but I didn't answer or accept friend requests. A guy messaged me on Instagram, just a simple, hi. I answered because he seemed so familiar to me. I had that feeling that I knew him. I just messaged him a, hi, do I know you? And we started talking. We found out that my uncle is his dad's friend and we had seen each other before. This guy is rich. And when I say rich, I mean he lives in a mansion in the most expensive and luxurious part of Guadalajara. He flexed his money in every way possible. He had several cars, expensive sneakers, new phone every other month, designer clothes, crap like that. First red flag. I told him that I wanted to start doing cosplay, but I couldn't spend my money since I was saving up for a new laptop. He told me that he could buy it for me. He wanted to buy the entire cosplay, including wig, contacts, heels, dress, props, everything in exchange for pictures of me wearing it. Of course, I denied. Second red flag. He was really pushy. Like he wanted pictures of me doing anime girl poses and just certain things in general. At this point, he was saying some really disgusting things to me. So I stopped talking to him because I was done with his BS. He didn't stop messaging me. 
I had almost 30 plus messages daily from him. I messaged him saying that I was done with him and that if he didn't stop, I would block him. He told me, and I quote, You're mine, so shut up. I have money and you want pretty stuff, so why not make an exchange? And I told him that having money didn't make him entitled to talk to me like I was an object. And he told me, You should consider it. I can buy you anything. Again, I told him that I didn't care about money and he told me, You're stupid. You have to send me pics. I can buy them off of you. I'll pay you. At that point, I had enough. I blocked him. I have to mention that he tried several times to buy me stuff and he wanted my address so he could send them. No thank you. I can't imagine what the guy could have done with my address. Update. A lot of you said that I should tell my uncle. I did tell him, but since we don't live in the same city, I don't know what came of it. My uncle is over 60 and he doesn't use social media. I called my uncle and here's some exciting news. My uncle said that when I told him, he called the guy's dad a few hours later, telling him what his son did to me, with details, basically the whole story, and telling him I was his niece. And the guy's dad was furious and so angry at his son, he was even angrier when he found out that he did it to his friend's niece. He took away his credit card and his cars. I don't know if he got them back or what. I also asked him what the guy's dad's job was because people were speculating that they were in the mafia and the guy's dad owns a hospital and some pharmacies. Am I the jerk? My sister wants me to adopt her baby, but I want a different kid. My husband had bad birth parents, so he and his siblings were removed and put into the adoption system. They tried to keep the siblings together, but at the time they were put in, my husband and his full brother were far older than their younger half-siblings. The younger two, a baby and a toddler, were adopted almost immediately. Then my husband was adopted at 10 and his older brother aged out at 18. The oldest three reunited, but they're still looking for their youngest. My husband and I want to adopt. Ideally, we want to adopt siblings so we can keep them together, and preferably older kids, at least 10, as we know it's harder for older kids to get adopted. Obviously, it totally depends on the kids we meet and who we work with as a potential family but we feel very strongly about adopting older siblings and keeping them together. So if we were to really click with older but unrelated kids or found a set of siblings that included kids younger than 10, we'd adapt that plan for them. The process takes a while, but we're nearly at the end of it. We've been approved as adoptive parents and were matched with two siblings recently, but something happened with their birth family, so the adoption was denied. We've been told that they'll rematch us very soon, but we've been waiting to hear back for a while now. There was meant to be an open day at a local home, but it's been postponed due to current events. Enter my youngest sister. She's 19, in university, and pregnant. She was going to terminate, but couldn't bring herself to do it. She reached out to us, asking us to adopt her child. We approved as adoptive parents. We have a decently sized house with more than enough room. She and the father would willingly allow us to adopt the baby, and it would be a very short process for us, because we are basically good to go here. However, due to the reasons stated above, this isn't exactly what we had in mind in terms of adopting. We're open to changing that plan, but there's also the issue of my sister being the bio mom. She says she can handle watching me potentially raise her baby, but I can't see this not causing issues and feel like if she's going to adopt out, she should do it with a couple who aren't so close to her. We explained this and refused. Since then, various relatives, none of whom can take the baby for various reasons, have contacted us asking why we can't take the baby. We've explained and re-explained everything but we're getting called selfish and mean and cruel for being picky because we're at a place in our lives where we can have a baby and we're turning it down. We thought about asking our friends who are also trying to adopt what they think, but saying, my sister offered me a baby but we don't want it, would be pretty tone deaf when some of them have been waiting for years for one. And that whole sentiment combined with my family's arguments have made us feel incredibly guilty. So we're turning to the internet. Are we the jerks? Info. We're in the UK and my husband and I have both been in our current employments for over two years, meaning we both have full access to paternity slash maternity leave. And we both took adoptive parenting classes that included baby stuff, so we're able to look after a baby, both in terms of competency and finances. But we do feel we'd prefer an older kid, and we don't know if having a baby could affect our current adoption attempts. We want multiple kids, as we're both from big families, and a baby in the house could cause an issue as we're trying to adopt older kids. They might think we just want a free babysitter. Update. I told my sister about our friends mentioned earlier, how they're a great couple who have been trying to adopt a baby for five years now, how they fostered babies and taken all the classes and know what they're doing, how they live locally and are willing to have an open adoption, and again repeated that myself and my husband don't want to adopt a baby. 
My sister said that open adoption to a couple of strangers wouldn't work for her, and a couple hours later said that mom and dad are going to help her out. So it looks like the baby will live with them for the next few years, and my sister and her boyfriend will take over when they can. Everyone now feels like I am somehow at fault for my parents not getting to enjoy the beginning of their retirement, but I no longer feel guilty, as it's clear that what my sister wanted all along was someone to raise the baby for a few years so she could step in as the mother whenever it suited her. Am I the jerk for continuing to sit on my porch like usual, even though my neighbor is having yoga classes in our shared backyard? So when I get home from work, I go and sit on my back porch and drink a beer or two. I just enjoy the sun and fresh air while I stare off into space. I actually share the backyard with another unit, duplex situation. The couple that lives there got permission from our landlord to use the yard to have yoga and other exercise sessions since their indoor studio space is being closed again. They have these classes around the same time because it's a convenient time for a lot of other people too. Two times a week, Wednesday and Friday, the lesson is women's only. One of my neighbors came over after their lesson last Friday. She was very non-confrontational when she approached me. She acknowledged that I had every right to sit there and it wasn't a problem on their co-ed class days, but said that the women felt uncomfortable with my presence during the women's only classes and are no longer wanting to attend. She explained that these are their most popular classes and the ones where they make most of their money and they can't afford to lose more clients. While I understand that, I really didn't want to give up my little outdoor time two days a week, so I continued to chill on the porch like I always do. On Wednesday, the class was already setting up and the women were all chatting. Not long after I sat down, my other neighbor, not the same one that talked to me the first time, came over. She was a lot more stern than the first one when she asked me to wait to come out till they're done. I get a little nervous when people are mad at me, so I apologized and told her I really needed this time to unwind. She asked me if I didn't think that these ladies needed this time too, that they live just as stressful lives and need to be able to feel safe here and not like some drunk guy is gawking at them. I'm really not trying to stare at them though. I usually just stare off into space and they're right in front of my porch, so I guess it looks like I am. I also don't drink enough to get drunk, usually just one beer, although sometimes more on Fridays. Like I said, I'm not really good at dealing with people when they're mad at me, so I ended up just apologizing again. She just stared at me. Eventually, she said, I just don't get it, and walked away. I could hear both of them apologizing to the women there. In the end, most of them left though. While they continued the class with the two people that remained, I could just feel them both glaring at me. So I ended up getting up a little early and going inside. Anyway, just a little while ago, I got an email from my landlord. In it, he was reminding me that the backyard was a shared space and that I need to be respectful of others when they are using it. Now, I'm unsure how I should handle today because I'm already tired and looking forward to relaxing on my porch, but today is another women's only day. Edit. Okay, so I just noticed the email from my landlord was actually sent to both me and the couple in the other unit. So, maybe he's not just talking specifically about me. Edit 2. Someone suggested I hold a book or magazine while I'm out there. So, I'm going to try that today and see if it makes everyone more comfortable. Edit 3. Someone else suggested maybe splitting the hour. I think I could work with half an hour a day and I'd be willing to let them pick their start and end time in case they prefer to start their class half an hour earlier or end it half an hour later than usual. I'm going to email that suggestion to both them and our landlord just so we're all on the same page, because I am kind of worried he's only getting part of the story. Also, a different person suggested maybe introducing myself to their clients so they can learn I'm not a total weirdo. I'm going to ask my neighbors and see if they think that might also help. Edit 4. Also might get a hammock to chill on instead. Edit 5. Thank you guys for all the suggestions for angling my chair, screens, using my front yard, don't have one, going for a walk, staying inside. Unfortunately, I don't think any of those work for my situation for the reasons I have explained in the comments. I'm just going to stick with the suggestions I've already mentioned in my previous edits. Thanks again though. Well, who do you agree with? OP or his neighbor? Please let us know. Put up a fence. Problem solved. Next. I did to my neighbor what they did to others. To start, I bought a house with the intention of doing a flip. When I moved in, the self-appointed block captain let me know who they were the first day. Sadly, they were my next door neighbors. I tried to be friendly, but listening to them, I realized how horrible they were and tried to keep still being civil. My significant other kept saying, just wait for it to be our turn. 
They bragged about, through their contacts with the city, forcing people to make improvements on their houses, getting undesirable renters out of the house, and just harassing people in general. As I worked on flipping my house, the wife became a worse thorn in my side. To start, she demanded I put up a fence so people would quit cutting through my yard and scaring her. Then her and the husband demanded I take care of the weeds in the yard or they would do it and bill me. After that, a storm caused a tree to scrape their shingles and they asked for $1,200 to replace them. The tree was there before I moved in and by co-ed, they are responsible to cut back the branches to the property line. When I wouldn't pay, they had a relative jump my fence and cut the trees down. Needless to say, I began to ignore them, so she became a constant gnat and moved on to another target. Then one day, as I was tearing down my deck for a patio, I realized she put a feral cat colony on a section of my property. I had wondered why all the stray cats were around and I finally found out. I reached out to the city and demanded it to be removed, but they said she followed the law on getting it in place. As I tried to get it shut down, she began unhinged behavior, from standing in her window staring at me, yelling out the window at me, to hitting the fence with items to scare my dog. Here is where my revenge started. I started by filing an HRO, harassment restraining order, against the wife and had it granted ex party with the evidence I provided. Of course, she contested as it was defamatory to her character. Before the hearing, the husband tried to physically intimidate me, so I filed one against him and it was also granted ex party. In the hearing, it came up that there was an HRO against the husband as well. They dodged being served until I had it published as a means of service. I started to make complaints about them and their house. Also, I made police calls when necessary. As I did this, the other neighbors began to realize they could do to them what they had done to them and others. For example, as I was having my front door replaced, needing a building work permit, I knew they were doing internal remodeling, so I called a city inspector and they were fined for not having a permit. As she ranted at the inspector, he looked at my window and saw I had mine displayed. Their back porch became hoarded, so I made another call to a city inspector and they had to clear it out. Then they had a broken window on the porch door, so I called an inspector and they had to replace the door. Next, the paint on their house was peeling, so I called an inspector and they had to repaint. The inspector also found the wood underneath was rotted along with their front porch was sloping, so they needed to fix the front porch, sections of wood, and repaint. Through all this, they had up cameras to prove they were not doing the things I said, like hitting the fence. They also pointed a camera at my backyard, as it was legal to point a camera into my yard and a part of my HRO was her intrusive watching behaviors, I gave the camera the finger on my way to and from the garage. When she complained, with the city tiring of her, their response was she was admitting to intrusively watching me. The fight over the cat colony came to an end when I realized one of the cats had a serious disease and I began to capture them and turn them into animal control. Don't worry, animal control was part of the feral cat program, so they would not be put down, but the neighbor would have to pay a fine to get each cat out or have the colony closed. Finally, I caught the sick one and it had rabies. Part of the program was for her to capture each new cat and have it vaccinated, something she admitted to willingly not doing on her GoFundMe for the colony. I soon had the GoFundMe shut down when I provided the evidence she was not using the funds as she stated they were going to be sued. The city now had to act to close the colony. The person at animal control who wouldn't respond to my complaints was fired. The neighbors called in a city mediator who we met with and presented all the evidence and said we would not meet with them and provided really mean tweets that they made about the neighbors. The city cut ties with them as community leaders. With their power to bully gone and having spent what I can only imagine in fines and repairs like they did to numerous other neighbors, after 14 years they sold their house and moved out, way out to the suburbs where they only have one neighbor about 50 yards away. They knew I was wrapping up my flip and would be out in less than a year. Without being able to bully their neighbors, with people having their back, they seemed to have no further reason to stay. Needless to say, I did several more things to wear them down. Finally, when I listed my house, it was sold while theirs was still on the market. As a final forget you to them, I reported to the county they had both the new and old house listed as their homestead, meaning they were paying less in property taxes so they got hit with more fines on my way out. Have you ever had a neighbor that you just couldn't stand? If so, why not? Please let us know. I can't stand when my neighbor forgets to smash that like button. Hint, hint.
Regular from my work thinks I work everywhere, apparently. Sorry for how long this is, but I literally still think about this all of the time, mostly because I still see this woman and she pretends like this never happened. I live in a fairly big city, so it's kind of unfortunate that I keep bumping into this woman who I have to say I'm not too fond of. I work in a gift slash curiosity shop, think candles and tarot cards and fancy overpriced bars of soap, in an older, affluent neighborhood in my city. Customer X comes into the gift shop quite regularly and always has a million questions and is the kind of customer that no matter how busy you are, demands all of the attention be on her. Now our shop is fairly small, so literally everywhere you turn, there's this woman. Fine, whatever, she's kind of rude but manageable and she always spends a decent amount of money. Now it's important to note that Customer X has a small dog, we'll call this dog Pickles, that is the cutest dog. The second Customer X enters the store, she drops Pickles' leash and goes about her business, leaving Pickles to do whatever Pickles' little heart desires. Sometimes it's just come and sit next to me and get pets, sometimes it's not. Again, it's not a big store, it doesn't really matter, Pickles can't really get into too much trouble, I like the dog. Flashed forward to our I don't work here story. One day I'm shopping at a well-known clothing store, the kind with levels and elevators, a real unit of a clothing store, clear across the city. While I'm looking at some sweaters, I feel a cold little nose press up against my leg, and when I look down, guess who I see? You got it, it was Pickles, tail wagging, leash trailing behind him. Customer X nowhere to be seen. I think to myself, I know this dog. I don't really want to bump into Customer X, I'm certain she will recognize me. We have interacted multiple times at this point, but Pickles is old and this was a big store. So I scooped the dog up and I set off to find Customer X. After too much searching, it turns out Customer X was on a completely other level than we were, meaning either A, this old Springer Spaniel somehow went up two escalators by herself, or B, this woman straight up does not give a hoot and left her dog on a random floor of a clothing store. Who does that? I tried to say a friendly hello to Customer X, something along the lines of, hey, I was shopping and I recognized your dog. And before I could even remind her where she knew me from and that it's not weird I brought her her dog, Customer X hits me with, do you have this shirt in another size? I hate this color. Why don't you have any different styles of this pant? I was so taken back by what I can only describe as the audacity of this jerk that I could only muster a polite, I actually don't work here. I work at the other store. To which she responded, well, can you go ask somebody for a different size? I was more than happy to say no. Entitled Mom's brat embarrasses herself in front of everybody. There was this girl in my grade who was a daughter of the vice principal. I'll call her brat. She would always try to use her mom's position to get what she wanted. If she got a bad grade on her test, she would tell the teacher to change it or else her mom would fire them. If she ran out of money on her lunch account, she would tell somebody to buy food for her or else she would look up their password on her mom's computer and take it herself. Of course, these are things the VP couldn't actually do, but Brad seemed to think her mom was a god and we all had to bow down to her because they were related. Now, Brad seemed to be terrible at everything. However, with the help of her mom calling in some favors and sweet-talking the coach, Brad got on the volleyball team. I was on the photography club and I worked a few of the volleyball games. Oh my god, I had never seen somebody so uncoordinated and terrible at volleyball. The ball was coming straight towards her and was impossible to miss, but somehow Brat tripped over her feet and fell onto another team member knocking her over as well. I took joy in taking pictures of the whole thing. Needless to say, I never saw her on the court again. Now here's where my story begins. My school is very serious about marching band and show choir. The school's first and only state championship came from band while I was a freshman. And guess who wanted to be on the band now? None other than Brad. She begged and begged her mom to get the band conductor to let her in, which he eventually did. This was a huge slap in the face to everybody who worked hard to get in the school's elite program. Remember how I said Brad was terrible at everything? Well, that applies to music as well. She showed up to the first practice not even knowing what instrument she wanted to play. After looking around for a bit, she decided on flute saying, how hard could it be? Now, let me tell you something about flutes. They are hard to play, or even just blow into. I play many instruments, and flute is arguably one of the hardest ones. If you blow slightly too hard, it doesn't sound good at all. You think this is easy, Brad? Yeah, good luck. The next practice, Brad showed up with a fancy, expensive flute and started bragging about the lessons she had taken. She tried showing off her new skills, 
but all that came out was a loud screech. Brat always reminded us that she had just started and she was going to be better than all of us soon. She struggled through a few more practices and would not stop complaining. This was ironic, considering I had heard her make fun of marching band many times before that and it was her idea to join after all. Weeks later, we finally start working on our show. The director then announces that there will be a flute solo to open the show, and of course I want it, but I'm not the only one. I'm staying after school one day practicing the solo, and Brat walks up to my room. Listen OP, you better not try out for the solo, or else my mom will expel you. I would love to see how that would work. I can just imagine me standing in front of the school board and Brat's mom saying, This is OP, I want to permanently ban her from this school for trying out for a solo. I told Brad that there was no way I was quitting, and unlike her, I actually had to work hard to get into band and I had always wanted a solo. Brad just stormed off and said, My mom's gonna kick you out and I won't be sad one bit. The day for the tryout is around the corner and I sprained my wrist in some dumb gymnastics project in gym. I couldn't really hold a flute and my doctor said it would take a while to heal. I was sad because I missed one of the only chances I would ever get to play a solo in band. But then it occurred to me that I didn't even know who else was trying out. Maybe Brat was the only one, and it's not like they would just give it to her when I would be just fine in a week or two. So I decided to show up to the auditorium where people were auditioning for various parts. I took a seat, and I noticed Brat's mom and some other teachers were there. I was in the back row, so nobody noticed me. It was Brat's turn, and she walked on the stage across from the band conductor and some upperclassmen who would be judging. She put down her music stand and started playing. Once she started, everybody went silent. I don't think awful is a strong enough word to describe it. The judges didn't want to be rude and cover their ears, but I did. When she was done, everyone was silent except for Brat's mom, who stood up and clapped while yelling, Yes, that's my girl. Brat smiled and turned to the judges and said, So, did I get the solo? All of the judges looked at each other and loudly whispered among each other. They turned to Brat and told her that they had a lot to consider. This infuriated Brat's mom, who walked up to the judges and started yelling. What do you have to consider? Brat was the only one to try out, which means she automatically gets the solo. I think OP still wanted to try out as well. We will pick the winner when she recovers, one of the judges tells Brat's mom. What? So you're picking a cripple over my daughter? This should be a no-brainer. Come on, Brat's mom. It's only a sprained wrist. It's not like I was going to be in a cast for the rest of my life. Brat left the auditorium, her mom following behind her while praising her. Before auditions for the next thing started, I went up and told the conductor that I would be healed in about two weeks. This worked out okay because it would be in time for the first competition. But however, the band was going to perform at halftime for the football game the next week. He was going to consider cutting out the flute solo for that performance or having some other instrument cover it for the time being. Brat's mom heard about this and was livid. She tried threatening, sweet talking, bribing, guilt tripping, and just about every other trick in the book to get the conductor to let Brat play the solo. Eventually, he let her know just what would happen. I got a front row seat to Brat standing front center at the football field with a microphone in front of her while she absolutely destroyed the hearing of anyone unfortunate enough to hear it. I even got a recording and kept it for myself. Usually people clap at the end of a solo, but instead it was silent. The rest of the band couldn't start playing any faster. The rest of the performance was great, but Brat's terrible opening solo ruined the whole mood. Brat was shocked. She had no idea why nobody clapped for her. One of the band members walked up to her and said, I'm just going to put it blunt. You're not good. This caused Brat to break out into tears in front of the whole crowd. Her mom rushed down from the stands and tried to comfort her. The next day, she quit band and good riddance to her. I eventually got the solo for myself. Everybody was glad that I did. I don't think I could have listened to Brat play the flute one more time even to save my life. After that, Brat was quiet and never made fun of band ever again. This just goes to show you that your mommy's position and money can buy a lot, but it can't buy talent or personality. Thanks for reading my story, and if you would like to hear more stories about Brat or her mom, let me know. Am I the jerk for medically tattooing my kid under the recommendation of a doctor? Hear me out. I, 31 female, and my husband tried for five years to get pregnant. Testing eventually revealed I have eggs of steel and without medical help, I'll never get pregnant. So that's what we did. Gave our samples, one petri dish and nine months later, I have two beautiful fraternal twins, Jack and Adam. Fake names. Thing is, Jack has a condition 
without going into detail, requires a shot once a week. Once he's older, he can take pills. I went back to work and mother-in-law offered to watch the babies. She's wonderful. I trust her 100%. They were 9 months, now 16 months. During this time, she would give his injection as we had a schedule. 10 a.m. before snack and nap. Worked very well until a month ago when she gave the shot to the wrong kid. Now, they may be fraternal, but they look identical. I'll be honest, my husband and I even mix them up sometimes. Everyone does. She immediately noticed her mistake, called 911, and they were transferred to the hospital. By the time I got there, Adam had been given the reversal agent and they were both happily sipping on juice, loving the attention. We went home the same night, told to push fluids. He was never in danger. It was a very slow-acting medication that, at worst, would have upset his stomach in a few days. Mother-in-law was beside herself. I tried to ease her worry, but she refused to babysit, so to daycare they went. This daycare has a nurse, cause some of the kids have medications, so she knew what to do. But the worry of mixing up the kids was a valid concern, and they would not keep name tags on. Doctor recommended a medical tattoo. Explained the tattoo is a freckle, no bigger than the end of a pencil eraser, on an area of skin that's easily seen while the kid is under mild sedation, similar to a dental office. Because of the area, it usually fades in 2-3 to three years, but by then, they should have developed more personal features and may not need it redone. So after discussion with my husband, we did it. He has a 2mm brown freckle on his earlobe. From entering the office to leaving, it took 30 minutes, never felt a thing. Mother-in-law lost her crap the second I mentioned a medical tattoo. I tried to explain, but she just freaked out, so I put both kids on the floor and told her to pick up Jack and find the tattoo. She picked up Adam, so I handed her Jack, and after 20 minutes, she still couldn't find it. I finally pointed it out, and she went, that's just a freckle. I just said, my point exactly. Adam doesn't have a freckle there, so that's how daycare can tell them apart. She's still upset and ranting. Once I explain to others and they fail to find it, they understand, but they still think I went too far in tattooing my kid and altering him. I believe I took the necessary precautions recommended by the doctor and the tattoo will fade with sun exposure as he grows. By the time he's five, it probably won't even be visible or it'll just look like a faded freckle. So am I the jerk? Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. Of course not. Mother-in-law's kind of being one though. You have the wrong email address, which means I'm going to make some bad business decisions. Last year, I started receiving emails from a building owner, affectionately known as Jezza by me anyway, and property manager for some building in the UK. I'm in Australia. It soon became apparent that they were under the impression that I was a business partner of Jezza. I tried to make it clear that they had the wrong email, but they just laughed it off for ages. I was not really a fan of the approach that Jezza took to hiring and paying cleaning staff particularly when one of the staff had some family emergency that interfered with her work and Jezza just called her a time waster. So I decided to mess with them until they got the point. The property manager was CC'd on all of these emails. When the property manager said the cleaner would work for 15 pounds per clean, I said we should pay 20 pounds instead. When Jezza said no, I responded with the following. I just thought after the conversation that me and Jezza Wobbles had over a couple of tinnies last weekend, that we agreed we no longer wanted to support a capitalist economy that entrenches the working poor. Let's actually start paying people living wages so that they can enjoy the pleasantries of life instead of wondering if they can make rent. That's what you said, wasn't it, Jezzy Poos? When Jezza ordered a sign for the bin store, I responded with this. Can we also arrange a sign for the back of the door at the main entrance, encouraging people to have a really lovely day? Maybe another one in the bin store telling them to follow their dreams, and can we install signs over the phone socket in each flat, asking them when they called their mum last? And finally, when Jezza called the cleaner a time waster for having the audacity to have a family, I responded with this. Time wasters are just the worst, which is why we've decided to let you go, Jezza. You've been filling our inboxes with a drivel for months and we're sick of it. Please clear out your desk by the end of the day. There were a couple more emails back and forth where Jezza actually said that if I didn't want to be included in emails, then there was a better way of saying it. I haven't heard from him since then, but I don't know if that's because he worked out I was not the person he thought I was or because he thought his business partner no longer wanted to be CC'd. But I need formula for my baby. Are you sure? I've worked in a supermarket for 10 years. You get your share of Karens and the only thing you can do is smile politely. But what I even hated more after an eight hour shift 
and having to close up the supermarket were the customers who came in 5-10 to 10 minutes before closing and just do their shopping like no one wants to go home. There was a time that I was scheduled every Friday closing shift and pretty much every Saturday closing shift. The store closed at 8. We weren't open on Sundays then. Also on Saturday, we had to take out all the cash drawers and manually count all the money. We would start doing this when all the customers had left and the front and back doors were locked. So, customers coming in 5-10 to 10 minutes before closing time and taking their sweet time to shop were hated. Hated with a passion. My job had a procedure. We would barricade our entrance and turn our front door on only opening when people wanted to leave the store at about 5 minutes before closing. We would remind customers at a quarter to 10 and 5 to closing time that the store was going to close and please go and pay for your groceries. Normally, we had very few incidents. This one, however, is burned in my memory. We've got colleague and we've got formula man. It was a Saturday. As head of the cashier for that night, I had the honor to make or break the day of our beloved customers. I had to deal with my fair share of Karens, male and female, and I just wanted to go home. So I followed the procedure and asked one of my fellow money handlers to set the front door and stay there to handle any customers. At two minutes before closing time, a man comes running to the door. My colleague asks what he needs and reminds him that the store is going to close and he won't have much time. He says he just needs formula. Since I was busy with a customer, she let him in. Guy gets a basket and goes into the shop. Since he said he needed formula, we thought he would be in and out like Roadrunner. Nope. No, because he didn't need formula. At 8.05, Formula Man is seen at the cheese section in our store. 8.15 at our wine section. What the heck does he need that for? What kind of baby does he have? Several of my colleagues have gone to this man to get him to go to the counter. He scoffs, huffs, and says that he's a paying customer. My fellow money handler was the last one to go to him, and that's when he went too far. He yelled at her, making a high school student cry. Now I'm upset, so I do what I always do in these situations. I take off my store shirt, pull out a neat jacket I keep in case of emergencies, and put it on. You see, when you have the store outfit on, you are often seen as a lesser being. But behold, I change my outfit, and suddenly I look like management, and my word is all-powerful. The real manager sees this happening, pops out a huge grin and goes to the back and watches from the security cameras. So, I don the magical outfit and go to the formula man. I tell him in no uncertain terms that the store has been closed for 15 minutes and he's been asked multiple times to go and pay for his things. He starts to huff and puff himself up like the big bad wolf. I'm a 5 foot 2 woman and people think they can intimidate me. I told him that he was only allowed entrance since he said he needed formula, so I gave him a choice. He could go now and pay for the things in his basket, or I would take the basket from him, grab the formula he claimed to need so much, and he could pay for that. He could choose not to do either, and in that case, security would love to make his acquaintance. Either way, he would leave now. He tried. Oh boy, he tried to threaten and intimidate me. He failed. He left, with his cheese and wine, and many threats to call corporate. The next week he came again, this time encounters me at the door. What did he need? Formula. So I brought him to our service desk, went inside and brought out a single pack of every kind of formula we had, asked him which one he needed. He didn't say a word and left. Don't mess with our closing times. Am I the jerk for flipping out on my daughter's teacher after she made the comment, well, life isn't fair to my daughter? So my daughter, who's eight, goes to a school system that just recently jumped on board with remote learning. As in, we literally just got tablets set up through the school last Friday. Prior to this, my daughter was going to school twice a week and was never sent home with any sort of school homework. Instead of easing their way into the remote learning like most schools have done, they decided to slam my daughter with 137 assignments the same day that the students were given the tablets. I'm sure you can see my frustration. On top of this, the assignments are due today all 137 of them, not to mention the six mandatory Zoom meetings throughout the day, which leaves very little time to do the actual assignments, and you can't access the assignments past 4 p.m. or on the weekends. My daughter and I have been working our butts off, literally from 5 a.m. My daughter is an early bird. Until 4 p.m. in the evening, we are on that dang tablet, trying to complete these assignments, which literally leaves my nine-year-old, my other kid, with no help on his homework at all. This morning, during a mandatory meeting, my daughter's teacher asked how everyone was doing. 
Her teacher is one of those teachers who should have retired 20 years ago and is still a jerk to all of the students and cuts them off mid-sentence every single time they speak. So when it came time for my daughter to answer, my daughter said, I'm feeling really overwhelmed. And her teacher said, well, life isn't fair, is it? And then went to move on to another student. Before she did, I said, excuse me? And popped my head into view of the camera. Her teacher instantly started saying, that came out worse than intended. My response was, yeah, I think not actually. I will be in contact with the school since you feel it's necessary to instantly shoot down students that you're supposed to be helping. I then logged my daughter off of her meeting and called the school. My husband said I'm being a Karen and that the teacher is probably just overwhelmed. I told him that I truly don't give a hoot if she is overwhelmed. She chose this career and it's hard on everyone currently, but that gives her no right to be a raging jerk to students who were just slapped with 137 assignments, whom barely even know how to work the school's pages because there was no training or overview. My daughter originally had 137 assignments. This morning, she had 46 left to do after busting her butt all week to complete them. The assignments just went back up to 101 like a half hour after I posted this. Well, what do you think? Is OP being a jerk or not? Please let us know. 137 assignments? Thank God I'm not in that class. Am I the jerk for losing it on my wife after she promised my stepson a PS5 and asked me to use my daughter's emergency fund? Hear me out. All right. I, male 42, have been dealing with so much. My daughter has a chronic disease, asthma, and on top of all of that, she's now dealing with pneumonia. It's been incredibly difficult. It's taking so long to recover, and it made things worse that we had to get more medical equipment and medication to help her get better. She's 12 years old, and I feel bad whenever I see her suffer like that. She doesn't get to do a lot of things like normal kids do. She plays video games since they don't require running and jumping. I feel helpless but I try to do all I can to make her feel more comfortable. I got a 15-year-old stepson. I'm not gonna lie, he's been nothing but disrespectful towards me. Even though I'm the one handling his education, health, and other things, he always throws the, you're not my dad, in my face whenever I ask him something, that's his attitude, and his mom does nothing to make the situation any better. Her response, he's just a kid, you know how boys are. Last week, my wife said that my stepson told her his friend got a PS5 and that he too wanted one and that it would be nice if I could get him one this Christmas. I said no because first of all, I work in a stressful field with a bad back and it barely covers for daily needs as well as my daughter's needs and she suggested I use the money I have for my daughter emergency fund and without it, I can't help my daughter in the future. She looked at me not liking what I said one bit. She said that this way, my stepson will resent me since she already promised him that she had talked to me about getting him the PS5. I blew up on her for promising him without talking to me first and putting me under a ton of pressure and implying that a PS5 will get my stepson to respect me. She lashed out at me for how I reacted and said that I should make efforts to mend the relationship between me and my stepson. But there are other ways than to buy his respect with money. After arguing back and forth, I told her I will be getting him something, but not a PS5. I have other commitments, including my daughter, who can't even sleep because of her condition. My wife called me selfish, even though I'm doing all I can after I got dealt a bad hand in life. My wife then went to sleep in the guest's room and ignored me completely. My stepson has no idea. He'd usually make a backhanded comment in the morning, but he's remained quiet for whatever reason. Well, who do you agree with? OP or his wife? Please let us know. This is why you never marry a Karen. Lady, I really don't care if you want to order. Get your hands off me. So, a bit of backstory. This happened about two years back when I was still in high school. It was summer break and a few friends, my uncle and I, went out for ice cream at one of our local shops to celebrate me receiving an invite to a very prestigious military school here in the States that I'll just refer to as WP. Since it was summer, there was a pretty long line at this tiny place and they had only had outdoor seating. Being that we were in a pretty big group, I had my friends go save us a table and I made a list on my phone with my friends and my uncle's orders so only one of us had to wait in the line. As I turned to head into the line, I heard it. You know, the noise someone makes when they think they're high and mighty. That condescending clearing of the throat. Now mind you, I'm pretty weirdly built for a female. I'm pretty short, like under 5 feet but I'm bulky from being a wrestler and doing weightlifting. 
At the time, I think I just had some standard jean shorts and a random shirt with my school's logo on it. Nothing that would have made me seem like an employee at the shop. Not that the actual workers ever would have come outside to take orders or anything. At first, I kind of tried to ignore the lady and keep heading towards the line, but she kept making her throat clearing noise again. And being me, I decided to see what she wanted. Now, I really didn't want to say anything to some random lady, so I sort of just made eye contact and raised my eyebrow at her. She had that pretty stereotypical Karen look. Mid-30s with that short-cut, fake blonde hair and tacky acrylic nails. When she realized I acknowledged her, she huffed before talking to me. Karen, well, it took you long enough. I want to order. Like, I sort of knew this jerk was going to be loud and really irritating, but I wanted to keep my cool and just explain the situation. Me, miss, I don't work here. I'm just grabbing what me and my group want, so we don't have to stand and... I don't care if you want to help your friends first. I watched you write down their order. You work here, and now you will help me as well. Okay, so clearly I was dealing with a crazy lady. Great. Me. Miss, I just told you that I don't work here. I'm just doing my group's order. After that, I turned to walk away. Turns out that apparently, like most Karens, sudden movement upsets them. As I turn, I felt those fake acrylic nails pressed into my wrist. This jerk actually decided to grab me. I quickly rip my arm from her grip as I turn around to face her. This mere fact that she had the audacity to grab me? Even if I was an employee, there's no reason to place your hands on someone. Me. Look, lady, even if I worked here, which I don't, you have absolutely no reason to ever lay your hands on me. Through this shouting, my uncle grabbed the manager to come help me out. They came out just to see me wrench my wrist from this Karen's grasp. Uncle. What are you doing to my niece? He grabbed my arm to check over my wrist. I knew I was bleeding a bit from when she had dug her nails in, but I didn't really notice it too much. The manager was trying to ask Karen about what happened as Karen rants about how I was rude, didn't want to take her order, and how I had assaulted them. Now obviously, I was the one with the nail marks on my wrist. The manager calmly explained that I didn't work there, nor do the workers come around to take orders. My uncle told the manager while I was okay, the lady needed to go. Needless to say, I got my ice cream and had a pretty nice time after that. Edit. Since a good amount of people have been asking, yes, I am currently enrolled at WP and on my second year. Speaking of ice cream, what's your favorite flavor ice cream of all time? Please let us know. Mm, rocky Road for the win. This is a ranch, not a gas station. But please, wait here until the sheriff arrives. To set the scene, the area I grew up in was very sparsely populated cattle ranching country often with more than a mile between houses and dozens of miles between anything that might even superficially resemble a town. This story takes place well before the era of cell phones. The remoteness of the area meant that if anyone should have car trouble, they would be forced to go to the nearest ranch house for help. Keep in mind, these were ranches that ran cattle, not businesses open to the public. But people were friendly and would invariably go out of their way to help anyone who was reasonable and polite. Unfortunately, not everyone qualifies for that description. Late one night when I was about 15, my family was awoken by the sound of a car horn extremely close to the house. We got up and stumbled outside to see what was happening. We were greeted by the sight of a trashy car right at our back door. Given the layout of the yard, this should have been darn near impossible. An older lady staggered out of the car, drunk as could be, and began to yell at us about our terrible service. My dad tried to calm her down enough for her to explain what she was going on about. It seems that she was driving along, realized that she was running low on fuel, and needed to find a gas station. Miracle of miracles, this gem of humanity saw the lights on our property from the highway and made her way all the way down our driveway towards us. And saints be praised, there were tanks of fuel all about the garage and shops. In her drunken stupor, she somehow looked onto an assortment of ordinary ranch buildings and thought, Ah, yes, gas station. She went to several of the pumps and tanks, but was flummoxed to discover that they were all either locked or wouldn't turn on, because gas theft is a thing. Enraged, she went in search of the office so she could scream at the manager for this terrible service. But rather than simply stagger around on her own two feet until she found that office, she chose to drive around. Finally, she found the back door of our house, assumed that she'd hit the jackpot, and started in on the horn. 
No matter how many times we told her that we were not a gas station and we did not sell gas, she continued to yell and scream incoherently at us that we were. Ever try to reason with a raging drunk? Yeah. My father instructed her to call the sheriff while he stalled for time. Knowing the drill from TV, I took note of the car, make and model, and license plate and relayed that when I called. The dispatcher ran the number and told me my information couldn't possibly be right. I went back out to verify and came back to Dell Dispatch that I was correct. Oh boy, it turned out that our lady of the perpetual inebriation had switched plates on the car and this really fired up dispatch. I got the impression there were links to other offenses. I was right. Dispatch told me that they were sending a deputy immediately and he would be out to our place in about 25 minutes. I discreetly relayed this to my dad who proceeded to put on a master class in time wasting. After about 10 minutes, however, this drunk woman was flustered and wanted to drive out. My dad didn't like the idea of this insensate lunatic doing any more driving around our breakable stuff, so he got behind the wheel and, slow as can be imagined, steered the old heap through the hazards of the yard and back out to the driveway. See, her initial entry into the yard was fraught with peril. Looking at her tire tracks, we saw that she came just inches from hitting the house twice and miraculously missed plowing into our wellhead by what could only have been millimeters. Any of those impacts would have been ridiculously expensive to fix. And as it turned out, this old jerk didn't have insurance. Talk about dodging the bullet. The old deer was screeching endlessly about still needing gas. So my dad pulled in front of one of the pumps and pretended to pump gas in the slowest way possible. I was still on the phone with dispatch, running outside for stuff like getting a better description of her and then coming back to report. Finally, dispatch said their officer was just about to our place. My dad and I were pretty upset at this point. If the officer arrived while she was still on our property, there likely wasn't much for him to do other than escort her off. But if they were to catch her on the highway driving drunk, our highway was so deserted that one could sit by it for an hour or more and not see anyone on it. And there was literally nothing for her to hit near the road even if she careened off at 100 miles an hour. The only person she was likely to hurt from heading out again was herself. So my dad told her he'd filled her up at no charge. He hadn't given her a drop of fuel and sent her on her way. I told dispatch which way she went and in under two minutes, the deputy had her pulled over. Our involvement in the case stopped there. But between the court notices in the paper and the small town gossip wire, we found out that the lady got into a mess of trouble. In addition to the drunk driving charge, which stuck, and not having insurance and the license plate thing, she was wanted for a number of previous offenses. The whole thing snowballed into one big pile and the courts decided to give her a nice long vacation behind bars. Maybe if she had listened the first time we told her that our home wasn't a gas station and we couldn't sell her gas, things would have turned out differently for her. As it turned out, there was one less drunk driver on the road for a while. Let's call it a win. Am I the jerk for arguing with my husband after he said I should buy expensive gifts since I'm a doctor? My husband and I have been married for three years. He has a large family. He always likes to be invited by his family for dinners, birthdays, anniversaries. He's always there. He's a police officer, but always makes sure to spend time with his family as much as possible. I'm a doctor. My schedule is always busy and it's not like I can swap shifts like he always does because of lack of people working at the hospital. This past week, he insisted that we visit his family and he started asking what they wanted to have as gifts this year for Christmas. He started putting together a list of family members and what gifts they wanted. I should point out that they didn't want to do this because they felt they shouldn't ask for specific gifts, but he told them it was okay and that he can afford those gifts no problem. His mom talked about a new kitchen set. His sister said she needed a hair straightener, not to mention her three kids her husband and also his aunt and her three daughters and their husbands. The list was long and I knew there was no way he could afford half of it, so I had no idea how he was going to get the money. We get home and he told me I needed to pay X amount of money to help get everything on the list for his family. I told him, no thank you, I'm getting them other gifts that I can afford. He threw a fit and was shocked by what I said. He said that I must have been trying to make him look bad in front of his family and that he was counting on me to pitch in and pay for the stuff. I'm taking care of two kids and their needs, also the rent and the bills and whatnot. When I told him I had other responsibilities, he compared his salary to mine, saying it wasn't fair and that I should pay since I'm a doctor and can afford expensive things. 
I told him I'm not obligated to buy his mom an expensive kitchen set nor an expensive hair straightener for his sister who doesn't even treat me well. He didn't like that and called me bitter and negative for feeling that way. Told me I shouldn't work long hours if I can't afford to buy decent gifts. We argued back and forth and he kept bringing up that I'm being bitter and resentful towards his family. He refused to talk to me after this and is now acting like he was wronged and hurt by what I said. His words hurt me because I work hard to earn money, but he thinks otherwise. Just to be clear, no, we don't have a joint account. Why would I since I'm taking care of almost everything? Besides, I don't get to save money when I'm constantly spending money on things. He does sometimes throw in my face that I'm a doctor and should be able to cover all expenses since I work long hours. Well, who do you agree with? OP or her husband? Please let us know. I guess police officers can be Karens too. Steal my bed? Lose your stuff. My uni had a dorm for foreign exchange students. It was intended for short-term residency and lacked many of the amenities of other dorms. The dorm was divided into pods, each with four or so rooms attached to a common kitchen and bathroom. It was four plus people to a room, no privacy, no locks, no real rules. You were assigned to a pod, but they didn't bother assigning beds, so you just took one and worked it out among yourselves. But rent was cheap, 150 euros or so, so local students also took advantage. Quarters were tight, but people more or less got along. However, there was one girl who is just the definition of entitled. She would buy enough groceries for a family of four, stuff the communal fridges full of her food, then leave it to rot and freak out at anyone who dared move her things or throw out her rotten food. She would shamelessly take someone else's laundry out of running machines, put her stuff in the machine instead, and leave the other person's wet laundry in a heap on the floor or wherever. To make matters worse, she apparently felt entitled to the best room or bed or whatever, and would routinely move to another student's bunk, dumping their stuff in the hall. Why this behavior was permitted to continue is beyond me, but whatever, it was uni. Each pod had a resident advisor, essentially a student mentor responsible for ordering repairs and babysitting. The RA got their own room with a locking door. Our RA graduated at the end of my third year and vacated her room over the summer. Entitled Jerk immediately moved in. Unfortunately for me, I was assigned as the new RA. I got the news less than a week before the end of my summer session. I told Entitled Jerk to move out. The resident manager told her to move out. Other people warned her. Her response? Don't any of you dare touch my stuff. She decided to go for a long weekend with some friends to get away from the hostile environment. Thing is, my classes were over and I was going home to my parents for the rest of the summer. My parents lived about 10 hours away by train and I wasn't about to drag my stuff home with me when I had a perfectly good locking room. I texted Entitled Jerk one last time, asked her what she wanted me to do with her things. Don't you dare, my stuff stays. Okay, well, that seems reasonable to me. So I got a couple of boxes from the resident manager, gently packed up her things, stowed them under my bed, moved my stuff in, and locked up. I got a furious text message a few days later demanding to know if I had locked her room, reminded her that this was my room. She demanded to know where her things were. Well, you told me to leave them, so I did. Told her that she was welcome to pay for a train ticket for me to come back, unlock my room, let her collect her things, and get the heck out. She declined, told me that if I wanted to come back, I'd need to pay for my own ticket. Well, given that I did not want to come back, I passed on her offer and stayed gone for the next four weeks. She had to wrap up her studies with four days worth of clothes, her computer was locked in my room, and as far as I know, she didn't even have a blanket and pillow. Never saw her again. Her parents got her stuff when I returned. Am I the jerk for not giving a high school ex closure? I dated a guy in high school, almost 25 years ago, for about 6 months. As far as high school relationships go, it was relatively serious and I can't remember the exact reason I broke up with him. Normal teenager stuff probably. But it was definitely the right call as he became vaguely stalkerish afterwards. Calls after being told not to contact me anymore. Gifts dropped off at my doorstep. Threats to my next boyfriend many months later, etc. This behavior went on, intermittently, for longer than our relationship actually lasted and ended after he graduated the following year. It was creepy and weird and made me feel very unsettled. However, I haven't thought about this guy in years until a mutual friend posted some high school photos on Facebook a few months ago and tagged everyone in them. I was sort of taken aback by the photo, so clearly I still feel unsettled by the situation all these years later. 
A couple of days ago, my ex reached out on Facebook Messenger with a lengthy message about his life now. Married, has a kid, saying that the Facebook photo highlighted the fact that I still consume a lot of his thoughts. Seeing his name in my inbox made my guts churn and I'm extra creeped out because it sounds like he's been obsessing over the end of our relationship since our friend posted that picture months ago. Evidently, his therapist has suggested he attempt to gain some closure by contacting me and asking for an explanation of why I cut him off so completely. I don't think it's my responsibility to explain anything and presumably absolve this guy of his behavior. And I think his therapist is crap for suggesting he gain closure by contacting me rather than giving him the tools to accept that not every situation gives people the closure they want. I ignored the original message, but received another one today, saying that he needs to hear from me so he can get closure and move on. Am I the jerk for ignoring him, or should I be helping this guy with his mental health by giving him the closure he says he needs? I don't think I'm the jerk here, but my husband and best friend think I might be, because what harm comes from giving him closure? ETA Okay, messages received loud and clear. I'm going to block without engaging at all. I owe him nothing, and while I feel for him if he's actually struggling, I'd prefer to look like the jerk, despite the overwhelming comments that I'm not, rather than give him the thin edge of the wedge to engage further. Thank you for your comments and well wishes. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you respond to their message or just ignore them? Please let us know. When my exes from high school message me, I just send them a picture of Mr. Reddit and they back off. You need to be out of the store within 15 minutes of closing. So, I used to work as a manager for a very large pizza chain that is franchised, and the franchisee at my particular store happened to be a supreme penny pincher, to the point where our broom broke a year ago and they're still using it. So, generally, after we close, it takes us anywhere from 10 minutes to 90 minutes to get the store cleaned up, and all the next day prep done depending on how busy we've been that day. It's always busy. Now, the franchisee who runs our store is not happy with how long it takes us to do all this. It costs him too much, he says, and has been complaining to me incessantly about how we all need to be done with our work and clocked out within 15 minutes of closing, something that is completely impossible 99% of the time. My record is 10 minutes for the quickest time and two and a half hours for the longest if anyone wanted to know. One day after hearing him complain for the umpteenth time about how long we take to close and how he could easily get it all done alone far faster than my team, I decided, okay, we'll be out within 15 minutes from closing. This particular day, however, was Christmas Eve. This is one of our most chaotic days of the year due to the combination of people who want pizza for the occasion, which is a ton, and lack of staff due to most of them saying they can't work over Christmas. Us managers usually have to double our hours over Christmas to keep the place running. So as expected, we have an absolutely chaotic day with everything running behind, all while being understaffed and swamped in orders. And then closing time comes. The franchisee has long gone home, leaving me with my two coworkers to close up and our store is an utter mess. Usually I get most stuff done before we even close, but there hadn't been a single opportunity that day. So the floor is littered with food and rubbish and the stack of dishes to do is four people high. Literally, four piles a person high each. I tell my coworkers to sweep and mop the floor while I blitz through all the cash counting and end of day paperwork and we get all that done in about 10 minutes. Now we're standing there with a pile of dishes and all the next day prep to be done and I look at them and say, well guys, the boss wants us out within 15 minutes so I guess we don't have time to do all this and with that we leave. So the next day, which is of course Christmas, we are closed and can't work but the boss decided to go in that morning and check that everything was done correctly. I of course get a message from him wanting to know why nothing is done and I just gave him my professional reply. I made sure we were out of there within 15 minutes, just like he wanted. I found out a couple of days later from a coworker that he had spent his entire Christmas day there, doing all of the cleaning and prep work on his own to get the store ready for Boxing Day. Something me and my team could have done in a couple of hours all because he wanted us out of the store quickly at night to save money. He never complained about how long we took again. Edit. Just want to say that the boss is a nice guy overall. He's just really cheap and has no business sense. Am I the jerk for saying how I'd choose my adoptive family over my biological one any day? When I was born, my biological family had given me up for adoption as they had no desire to be a mother and father to me. I don't have any memory of them, and even though I've never met them in person or got to know them, I still despise them for giving me up so easily. 
I grew up in an orphanage and the kids there would constantly harass and ridicule me and it wasn't very pleasant. It took a while to find an adoptive family for me as most people in my country prefer adopting newborns instead of grown-ups. I was losing hope and I've started to think that nobody would take me in and I'd stay there forever. However, a very lovely couple met me while I was there in the orphanage and seemed to like me and I liked them back. They were honestly so kind to me and praised me for my art that I had drew. It didn't take long for them until they decided they'd adopt me and it was the happiest moment of my life. I was so glad to be a part of their family. About a week ago, I got a call from my adoptive mother saying that she had just got contacted by people who claimed to be my biological mother and father and that they had liked to meet up with me sometime and I agreed. Once I met up with them, they were talking about general stuff but then it began to turn really awkward as they were ignoring some personal questions I'd asked them. Later, they started speaking about my adoptive family. They said how they seemed like boring people and asked me how I could even stand to be in the same room as them for a minute. My biological mother criticized the way my adoptive mother dressed and my biological father said how my adoptive father seemed like someone I'd be ashamed to be related to and that I'm lucky I'm actually not. The second they said that, I lost it. I told them that I'd choose my adoptive family over them any day and that they were cruel and horrible people who do not have the authority to say anything about them because they were the people who saw me as a burden and got rid of me. My biological mother was crying and my biological father was silent but I couldn't care less. I put on my jacket, got out of the shop, and called my adoptive father to come get me. I think I'm in the right here, but a part of me is saying that I'm the jerk in this situation. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Well, what do you think? Was OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. Not at all, but his biological parents sure are. Refuse my help? Enjoy your wait. Obligatory. This happened years ago when I worked at a big box furniture store. This store was massive with a marketplace, warehouse, and two restaurants. It had dozens of departments and every employee had specific tasks. Mine happened to be cart retrieval and helping customers load their flat packed furniture into their vehicles. One random weekday, my coworker called in sick, so I'm carrying double the workload when my radio goes off. Customer at the exit needs help loading. Got it. I was finishing up with another customer not too far away, so I was there within minutes. Me. Hi, I'm here to assist you. Where's your vehicle? Customer. It's about time. I've been waiting here for 15 minutes. She hadn't been. I had just walked by there five minutes beforehand. Me. Sorry about that. I was with another customer. I came within a few minutes of being told you needed help. Where's your vehicle? Customer. Are you saying I haven't been waiting that long? Me. No, I'm just saying I came within a few minutes of finding out you needed help. I don't like your attitude after waiting so long. I want an apology. Me. Ma'am, I already apologized to you. Where's your vehicle? Forget it. I'll find someone else. Me. I'm literally the only person here that can help you. I'll find someone else. In such a way that every syllable was its own sentence. Me. Okay. I walked away and continued working since I was incredibly busy loading other vehicles and retrieving shopping carts from everywhere, including the occasional cart corral. 30 minutes later, my radio goes off with a slightly annoyed tone. That customer by the exit still needs help. I offered to help her, told her I was the only one to help her and she refused, so I don't know what to tell you. Okay. 20 minutes later, I see my manager, the cashier manager, who was on the other side of the radio, and the warehouse manager talking to her. The cashier manager had called my manager and went to meet with the customer. The two of them are middle-aged women who then had to call the warehouse manager to load this large box containing a dresser. I walked past them and leaned against a post and watched. She was irate, yelling and complaining about customer service. She spotted me and scowled at me before getting in her car and driving away. I approached the managers and explained what happened. One of them said, we get it, before we all separated and went back to work. She had to wait over 45 minutes because she was too entitled to wait for 5 minutes. I'd like to think she learned a valuable lesson, but she probably tells a very different version of the story. Never assume what languages a person can or cannot speak. So this is an old story for me. Happened back in 08 when I was a stock person at a big box all-purpose store, including a grocery section. I had a working knowledge of where pretty much everything was in the store because I was all over the place, but the grocery department had its own stock team specifically, so I wasn't as knowledgeable there. Now, two things to note here. I am of Lebanese descent, and I was working in South Florida at the time. For those that don't know, South Florida has a significant Cuban population. 
but not so much Middle Eastern folks. I got confused for Cuban all the time because I had darker skin tone, similar to a lot of Cuban folks. I also speak fluent English, Arabic, and French, but I was born and raised in the Midwest, so my accent gives no indication that I might be of Middle Eastern heritage. On this fine afternoon, I was wheeling back an empty tub back to the stockroom after having emptied out one department over. Walking through the main aisle next to grocery, I hear an, excuse me, not rude, but definitely not polite either. I turn to find the Arab equivalent of Ikaren. Let's call her Khadija. Khadija is a 30-something looking woman wearing yoga pants and a tight shirt and a really fancy hijab and jewelry. Because that makes sense, standing with her husband. I grew up in a predominantly Lebanese community in Southeast Michigan, so I definitely know the type. The conversation goes as follows. Me. How can I help you, miss? Khadija. I'm looking for a specific item, but I can't find it. Me. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not as familiar with the grocery section, so I'm not sure where that is. Let me grab one of my colleagues for you. One moment. I could see one of the other customer service guys in the grocery section, so I radioed him to come over and help her out. Me. He'll be with you shortly, miss. Khadija. Thank you, but I'm in a hurry. I thought you worked here and knew your store. Me. I'm sorry, miss. I don't really work in this section. Colleague is coming right down the aisle now. Khadija to her husband in Arabic. They always get these stupid kids to work in these places, but they don't know how to do their job. This jerk doesn't know his head from his butt. The husband gave Khadija a look, probably because he saw my expression turn from my customer service smile to a frown. I had an internal debate about what to do next when her husband spoke. Husband in Arabic. Stop talking. I think he understood what you said. Khadija in Arabic. Of course he didn't. He's an idiot. He doesn't know his hands from his feet. It's an Arabic idiom. Doesn't translate the best. Me in Arabic. Actually, I understood every word you said. I don't appreciate being called fat and stupid. An older lady like you should know better than to insult people trying to help you. Worse, you wear your hijab like a hypocrite pretending to be devout, yet you abuse your perceived social lessers? You should have some respect for yourself. Khadija looked like she had been hit by a truck. Her olive skin turned ghost white, and she sputtered at me. You, you speak Arabic? Me, in Arabic. Obviously I do. Maybe next time you'll think before you insult people who help you when you think they can't understand. Khadija grabbed her husband's arm and dragged him out of the store, completely mortified. I could hear her husband yelling at her in Arabic that he warned her not to be a jerk all the time, especially when she doesn't know who understands her. I wasn't personally that offended, but I won't deny it was satisfying to scare some sense into her. My ex, Karen, lied about me on social media. I got revenge. So background info. I dated the same girl since I was a senior in high school to my second year of university. We are both the same age. We broke up plenty of times and got back together but she officially broke up with me for the last time in my second year of uni. It's been two years since then, and I'm in fourth year. I still care about her dearly, to be deathly honest, and she knows it. She has made countless YouTube videos with her friends talking about embarrassing things about our relationship, but giving me an alias so that people don't know who she's talking about, or has made these cryptic tweets about me that I can clearly tell are about me. But when I message her to take it down or delete it, she says it has nothing to do with me, I'm acting like a weirdo and that I need to leave her alone. Honestly, for a while, I thought maybe I was just going crazy or just blinded by the fact that I still cared about her and that she really isn't thinking about me and it's just my own self-pity that is making me think that she's doing these things to get a rise out of me. I told my friends about this and they told me that people are starting to read it as if I'm not over her and that I'm deluded and it's starting to get stalkerish. I listened to their advice because it's depressing enough as it is and tried to move on with my life. A year went by and one day my sister told me that she had gotten a follow request on Instagram from my ex. I left it alone and didn't make a big deal out of it. Probably at like 3am, I got two notifications that said I had got a message from her and she had tagged me and my sister in her recent post. I thought I was dreaming so I closed my phone and went to bed. I checked my phone the next morning and the notification was still there. So I screenshotted it and clicked on it for evidence, just in case, I told myself. I clicked on the notification, but she must have deleted it because it sent me to the Instagram equivalent of like a 404 error page. I asked her why she tagged me and my sister and she went off on me, telling me that it's been two years since we broke up and that I've become a stalker or something to that degree. She posted our conversation on Twitter and cut out my name. She made a bunch of tweets like, Seriously? 
you need to leave me alone, and stuff like that. I was getting messages from mutual friends that I'm losing my mind and need to see a therapist. That was the last straw for me. I posted the screenshots of the notifications, then took screenshots of every cryptic tweet I felt was about me and explained why. And I called her a jerk because she knows exactly what she's doing and it's evil. I was very satisfied with myself because it seems that a lot of people are a lot more understanding of me. But there are also a lot of people who are telling me what I did was extremely mean and out of spite. I don't know, she honestly made me feel like a psychopath and it just feels like this was the right thing to do. Am I the jerk? Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. It might not be easy, but I think he needs to block her and call it a day. Am I the jerk for not participating in Christmas activities with my wife and kids? My wife has always been more into holidays than me because she didn't have much of a family and they were dysfunctional. I grew up in a huge family and have already experienced as many big Christmases as I need. It wasn't a big deal, but since we have kids, ages 2, 5, and 12, she is obsessed with making it special. Over the years, she started a lot of new traditions that include decorating the tree and a bookshelf with the kids. She knows that I don't like to bother with any of that. I mean, I let her do it, but I don't want to be involved since weekends are my only days off and that's just unnecessary work. The thing is, she keeps asking me if I want to help or go with them to see lights, which takes forever, or do gingerbread houses. I could not have been clearer. So today, when she put up the tree, I just avoided all of that by staying in the bedroom with the door closed. She says that I'm the jerk for refusing to participate and that I'm acting like I have holiday-related trauma, when really it's the weekend, it's my time, and I just want to relax. I don't see what the big deal is. I get that she's trying to give the kids what she didn't have, but it's not my fault that she had a hard childhood. It seems like something she needs to get over instead of trying to play catch-up. Wife wants to make a big deal out of Christmas when I just want a break. Am I the jerk for wanting to scale back? Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. You're a mean one, Mr. OP. Seriously though, who crapped in this guy's eggnog? Am I the jerk for telling my boyfriend he's a bad person? So recently, my boyfriend got some dental trays for his teeth done, molds of your teeth, which can be used to put product in to whiten your teeth. He's done this before, but lost his last set of trays, so went somewhere new to get some new trays done. My boyfriend told me that when going to pick up his dental trays, the receptionist just gave him the trays without asking for the payment of them. He then took the trays and left, knowing he had not paid for them. The receptionist called shortly after he left and explained that a mistake was made and could he please either come back and pay for the trays or pay over the phone. My boyfriend lied, saying he was adamant he had already paid before picking the trays up and it wasn't his fault that they had no record of him paying and that he didn't keep his receipt to prove it to them. He was pretty vocal to me about not wanting to pay for the dental trays if he didn't have to and that it was the receptionist's mistake and on her. What sparked our argument about this was a car journey where he answered the phone to the manager of the dental practice who was following up the call with the receptionist. My boyfriend continued with his lie that he had already paid and it was not his problem that they could not provide proof of this. Now, something about witnessing him lie so easily to this man really bothered me and it bothered me that he didn't care if the receptionist may get into serious trouble or even lose her job over this mistake or that he wasn't losing out by paying as he would have paid for the product in normal circumstances. After the call, which didn't reach any resolution, I told him that was very uncomfortable for me to hear and witness and he's a bad person for lying like that when he knows full well it was likely an honest mistake by the receptionist and he got a product he didn't pay for. My boyfriend is now giving me the silent treatment and seems really hurt that I called him a bad person. He says most people would avoid paying for something if they didn't have to. Am I the jerk? Should I apologize? Update. Thanks for the rewards. A lot has happened since my original post. I spoke to the manager of the dental practice. I explained that my boyfriend had been open to me about not paying and that he doesn't plan to. The manager said a letter was already on the way demanding the payment and if boyfriend fails to pay, then court proceedings will begin. He was thankful I called and knew it was their mistake but was surprised by my boyfriend's attempts to argue with him. That's a good result for now. I didn't plan on telling my boyfriend as I wanted to end it. There's been too many red flags, so I decided I couldn't ever really trust him and I didn't want to add fuel to the fire. But before I got to end our relationship in person, I learned another painful lesson. Recently, my boyfriend's laptop broke. This was fine as it was old and he can't work from home anyway. He sells cars, so he's used mine. 
earlier this week, I'm on my laptop working and go to check my personal emails, except my boyfriend's email was still logged in when I opened the webpage. I go to log out, but saw the most recent 30-ish emails were all from the same person, a girl. This was weird, as who emails like that to converse anymore? I knew it was an invasion of privacy, but I clicked onto the emails. I deduced this was a girl from his work. They were emailing because her mobile phone was broken, and emailing him from her work email during the day was an easy way for them to still talk. The emails were flirtatious. They mentioned dates they had gone on. He had clearly been to her house. They spent lunch breaks together, and she thought he was single. The more I read, the more enraged I became. What if I had never clicked the email? After considering where I could bury him, I decided to remain calm. I called my manager to tell her what I had just learned. She's super cool and said to take the afternoon. I then called an emergency locksmith and packed up my boyfriend's stuff. He alternates between staying at mine and at his mom's, except for his PS5 I bought for his 25th birthday last month. When this purge of my boyfriend from my life was ready, I text him. I know about S. Our relationship is over. Your things are on the doorstep. You must transfer me the money for XYZ. Please don't ever contact me again. And I blocked him on everything. 20 minutes later, a barrage of knocks are at my door as he's pleading to be let in to talk about it. I can see him, but stay silent where he can't see me. He was on his knees crying, begging and pleading for me not to leave him. Whether they were crocodile tears or not, my heart ached. After some time, he left with his stuff. I felt relief and had a good cry, but I doubt that's the last I'll hear from him. I feel heartbroken and stupid. An enormous thank you to all of the people who said his behavior was revealing of his character and what he's capable of. I will apply the same vigilance to future partners. I know this is a dodged bullet, but it hurts like heck. Edit. I just wanted to clarify some things. I kicked him out of my house. I own it. He's never paid anything towards it and has no documentation linking him to my house. He alternates between staying at mine and his mother's, with his mother's being his official and primary residency. Weirdly, some of you were really focused on the fact I kept the PS5, but I paid for it, have the receipts, and it never left my home. I feel like retracting this gift he's had a little over a week as a jerk tax is morally justified after he's been a five-star jerk. I think they'd be very different comments if this was the other way around and he had just given me an engagement ring and then found out I was cheating not even two weeks later. Yeah, it'd be mine under the jurisdiction of a gift, but is it morally right I get to keep the ring? Probably not. I get the sense half of these comments come from the fact the console is hard to find at the moment, but I just pre-ordered it like everyone else who got one. Some are interested in whether I'm selling it. I'm undecided because on top of everything, my ex owes me a sizable amount of money, so it depends on whether he decides to be a jerk with a cherry on top and not pay me back. I noted down the email of the girl my ex was cheating with in case I wanted to contact her directly. I was thinking of constructing a message explaining everything and assuring her I'm not bitter towards her. Then it's up to her what she decides to do with that info. Thanks so much for all the supportive messages and comments. I'm reading every single one. I'm honestly shocked at the amount of kindness from strangers. If you got something for free that you were supposed to have paid for, would you go back and try to pay for it or not? Please let us know. I sure wouldn't. That's God's way of telling me that I deserve it. Why are you illegally searching my guest's car? This happened many years ago when I was first in hotels. I've been in various positions, left hotels and gone back over 15 years. It's worth noting this was just barely before smartphones. Back in the good old days, our hotel was mostly a suburban business and government hotel. It was extremely rare we got anything else other than tourists off business season. Rates were high. We were somewhat busy and had four to five people waiting to check in, all in varying levels of business attire. I'm about to check in a guy in a suit, mid-50s, when someone interrupts his check-in. Um, hey, just so you know, the police are searching someone's car in your driveway. Not sure what's going on. No one is there with them. I look around at all these professionals, with most people arriving by shuttle, and ask if anyone is in the driveway. The guy I'm checking in says he is. I ask what kind of car he has, if it's his or a rental, and ask him to wait to check in so I can see what's going on. I walk out there and there's an officer with his back kind of slanted to me watching another officer go through the car. It definitely matches the description. The one in the car is going through the glove box, leaning over from the open driver's side. I'm young and had a few stupid run-ins where I was searched for no reason with nothing found. We have significantly good relations with our local PD now, but I was like, what the heck, and feeling bold. I walk up to the officer watching. He doesn't realize I'm there, and I say, hi. 
He turns, startled, takes a step back, eyes kind of wide. Why are you illegally searching my guest's car? Actually looking nervous as heck. Um, well, the car was left unlocked and we were trying to see if anything said information about whose car it was. You know this neighborhood and all. Don't want the car getting stolen. The townhouses next to my hotel cost like 1.5 million. The apartments like 900,000. There can be some foot traffic as it's a suburban city, but this is utter BS. It's in the driveway of a hotel along with other cars. How did you know it was unlocked? Are you just walking around checking all the cars in our driveway? Um, well, the person whose car you're searching parked here and is in line waiting to check in. I will let them know they left it unlocked. I don't remember what he replied. At that time, the other officer had come out to see what was going on. It was something like, Okay, we're good. Just trying to look out for people. I know this sounds like r slash that happened, but they actually burned rubber out of our driveway, like tires screeching onto a 25 mile per hour suburban street. I went back in, told the guy they were searching his car as I checked him in. He was confused as heck. It was a rental car from the airport two miles away. He was on an LNR at a local major business. I just told him sorry, they're a little aggressive here sometimes. I really don't want this to be a political post, but I do want to say I have seen this specific force improve and be a good example in our area. Working in hotels, I've had them take people to rehab, shelters, food kitchens, etc. that they could have just arrested. This post isn't meant to be positive or negative towards the police, just a story of a random thing at my hotel. Speaking of hotels, what was the last hotel you stayed at? Please let us know. Best Western for the win. Am I the jerk for returning all the presents I got and buying my own because I'm tired of receiving what I feel are thoughtless gifts from everyone? I try to not be spoiled, but my whole life I haven't felt thought of in the gifts I receive. I never show it and always act thankful to be polite. The gifts I give others are always personalized if I haven't been asked for specific items. I listen and use their hobbies and interests to make sure they're a hit. One of my favorite things was the shot of euphoria when they opened their present and were speechless. Then it comes time for me to open my gifts and it's a generic set of headphones, much worse than the ones I own and colors I hate. A face wash and a candle set that I can never use with sensitive skin and allergies. A mug with a weird meme on it that is no inside joke between us that won't fit in my cabinet with a matching set already inside. I'm tired of feeling like the coworker you don't know that you picked for office secret Santa. I stopped hoping they finally listened or got me something from a list I specifically gave in case they couldn't be asked to put thought and effort into it. I can't think of a gift I've received that wasn't donated or stuffed in a box in storage, yet every gift I've given others is still on display, used, talked about, or complimented when seen. Why don't I deserve that effort? My friends are so great in every other way. My husband loves me endlessly and there's no other area I feel we're lacking, so why don't they try and get me something from my interests? Why am I unwrapping a clearance tea set when I'm a coffee drinker? We all sent out lists again weeks back and my husband said he had already done his shopping and was excited to wrap my gifts. I was hopeful this time he got me something from my list. While tidying, I found a stash with candy, a pair of cheap slippers and a pattern I'd never wear, a makeup travel bag with a tacky slogan, slay all day on it. I despise quotes on anything and it's well known and a pair of gloves. I just felt deflated. I felt sunken in on myself. I realized I'd never get the joy of opening a gift and being blown away by its thoughtfulness. I cracked. I told everyone I wasn't doing gifts this year and to return anything they got me because I didn't have the money and wanted to be fair. It's true. I don't have the money to waste $1,000 plus on personalized gifts for everyone just to feel disappointment. I canceled all my orders, returned all the items I got, and bought things off my own list using those funds. I wrapped them and put them under the tree to me from me. Husband is hurt, friends are disappointed, family has told me of how spoiled, entitled and petulant I'm being. I think they're just mad that they aren't going to get gifts from me this year that they boast about and post online and get tons of comments about how cool it is. This year I'm getting what I want and going forward this may even be my tradition forever so I finally get things I'd like. But as Christmas gets closer I'm starting to feel guilty and ashamed for what I've done. Am I the jerk? Edit. Few things I should clear up. 1. All I said to my family was that I wouldn't be participating in gift exchange this year due to my budget. I didn't mention that it's because I don't like their gifts. My own parents are the ones assuming that is why because they have the largest track record for being the worst at gifts for me and have been called out on it. Example being last year they got me a bunch of tea when I hate tea and love coffee. 
I left the tea behind and nicely said I wouldn't drink it, but my mother would and should keep it. I was told I'm being ungrateful and expect to be catered to. 2. No one knows about the gifts I got myself or will see them except my husband. Due to lockdown, we won't be seeing family in person this year. 3. While I did return everyone's gifts this year, that does exclude all of my husband's. I usually get him quite a few, but I cancel about half of them. He'll still get 5 to 7 or so, and I made sure I didn't get myself more than I got him to unwrap. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. You better get me something good this year, Mr. Reddit. Last year was unforgivable. I wasn't worth her attention until suddenly I was. I worked at a bookstore that has gone the way of the dinosaurs. A woman comes up to the register with two of her friends. They're gabbing nonstop, and the lady in question doesn't even pause as she plops an armful of books on my counter. Okay, I can live with this. I don't have to make small talk. So I ring up her books. I don't remember the total now, so I'll just throw one in there. Me. Okay, ma'am, your total is $11.50. Woman to her friends. Blah, blah, blah. She absently pulls out a $10 bill and sort of limply tosses it in my direction. Me. Ma'am, the total is $11.50. Do you have another dollar and fifty cents? She barely breaks eye contact with her friend to tilt her head a tiny smidge in my direction. No. So anyway, yakety schmackety. Me. Um, okay then. Ahem. <clears throat> Ma'am, will you please choose which of these books you are not buying today? Record scratch. I suddenly have her full and complete attention. Lady. What? Me. Please choose which of these books you want me to take off your total and put away, since you're not buying it today. What are you talking about? I want to buy them all. Me. Speaking with infinite patience. Well, ma'am, your total is $11.50. You only gave me a 10. I asked you if you had more money to cover the full amount of your total and you told me you didn't. So I need to ask you to choose which books you're not going home with today. I pick up a random book at random, shake it gently in the air and make as if to go put it back on the bookshelves. Lady. Oh, wait a minute. I, um, ah. She turns a bit red, promptly fishes in her purse, pulls out a $5 bill and hands it over. Me, smiling my retail smile. Thank you, ma'am. Here's your change. Have a nice day. No apology, but she clearly felt at least a little bit ashamed or guilty for not paying attention because she wouldn't look me in the eye as her friends make fake snickering sounds. I don't think she was being malicious or trying to lie about not having money until she was called out. I just think she wasn't paying attention at all. She just fired off a no at random to what she thought was a generic retail question so she could get back to her all-important conversation. She had no reason to give an anonymous retail person the time of day until she suddenly discovered that something important was actually happening. We can all hope that this incident taught her a small lesson, but I'm not taking any actual bets on that. Am I the jerk for being angry at my fiancé's family and telling them to grow up? I, 27, male, have been with my fiancé, 27, female, for two years. Six months ago, I proposed. Her family has always gotten along with me. In her culture, it was forbidden for younger sisters to marry before their older ones. Siblings had to marry in birth order. I had no idea about that. She's third generation Canadian. Her parents don't have any siblings, so it wasn't a problem. One of her grandparents has a younger brother, but he's never been married and is more of a scholar, so it wasn't a problem. She has one sibling, 30 female. Last year, her sister's boyfriend of seven years left the relationship because of her putting on him pressure to marry. He always said marriage wasn't for him, but he was okay with a committed relationship without it. They had lived together for almost five years. My fiance did feel for her, but at the same time, her sister didn't listen to what he said and she thought she could change his mind. Her family was not happy about the engagement. They said she shouldn't have gotten engaged before her sister was married and she should have said not yet to my proposal. Now they want us to wait until her sister gets married. She's completely single now and her getting married would take years. This never came up before. They always got along with me fine. Her sister was especially upset at hearing the news. Her four grandparents, great uncle and parents are on her sister's side. We've decided not to wait to get married because there's no end to this lockdown in sight. We're getting married Friday on our two-year anniversary. We will do it outdoors. The only people there will be the officiant and two friends to be witnesses and take pictures and video. The three of them work with us. We work in a hospital. I'm a histologist and my fiance is a respiratory therapist, so we won't be around any new people. We'll stream it for any family and friends and colleagues who want to watch and we'll mail slash email the video and photos to anyone who asks. We won't have a reception or a honeymoon until things are better. 
Her parents, sisters, grandparents, and great uncle say they will not watch the wedding. I'm angry at them. We live in modern Canada. People don't get married young as in past times. Her sister is an adult with a college degree and a full-time job, but she is being so petty and my family is supporting her. It's not like we got engaged the day her sister's boyfriend left her. More than a year has passed. Am I the jerk for being angry with her family and telling them to knock it off? She's hurt to have no family support. Work has been heck for both of us due to what's going on, and either of us getting a day off has been like pulling teeth. No one's fault, just what's going on. We both have to work the day after our wedding too. Besides work, we haven't left our home for anything since March. We are working extra hours. We just want one nice thing. I'm also wondering if they will be angry if my fiancé gets pregnant before her sister. I don't like seeing her hurt. Well, who do you agree with? OP or his soon-to-be in-laws? Please let us know. Some traditions really need to be thrown out the window. Am I the jerk for refusing to give my brother money for surgery on his nose so he can breathe out of it again? I'm 31, female, and my brother, who's 29, needs surgery to fix his nose because he can't breathe out of it. In the last 11 years, he's had four nose jobs and now his nose is so small he cannot breathe. The nose jobs are not the only plastic surgery he's had. He's had lip injections to the point where he can't close his mouth and lips all the way. I can't even remember everything else. He was turned down by several doctors because they said going smaller like he wanted would interfere with his breathing. He eventually went to Mexico and paid a doctor in cash. It ended up smaller, but just like the other doctors said, he can barely breathe out of it. The only doctor who will touch his nose with a 10-foot pole because of the damage doesn't do payment plans. We have public health care here, but it doesn't cover anything cosmetic or procedures like this in other developed countries. He's in debt on all of his credit cards. That I know of in personal loans is at least 20000 He tried getting another loan from the bank, but was turned down everywhere he went. Our dad died unexpectedly two and a half years ago. After he passed, our mom sold the house and their vehicles. She kept one third of the money from the sales and gave my brother and I each one third. He spent his one third on leg lengthening surgery abroad and has none left. I haven't spent any of mine yet. I was in the military and served for 10 years. I was badly injured on deployment six months before our dad passed and was discharged after my injury. Between my money I saved while serving and from my mom, I almost have enough for a down payment for a house. Our mom lives in a retirement apartment. The complex takes care of things like repairs and snow removal and stuff. All her money from the sale and her savings is in a special kind of investment. It pays for the complex rent and her credit card. Her card only has a small limit because it is for incidentals. She can't access the special account to get money from my brother. He asked her, but she can't access it that way. I'm his only other family. He says I should be a good sister and sacrifice so he can breathe out of his nose again. If I give him the money, it will take at least an extra two years for me to save it back up. He's asked for it outright rather than giving him a loan, but he would never pay me back. His nose will be bigger after the surgery and I know he won't like it and will get another procedure to make it smaller again. This happened with his lips. They almost burst and a doctor reduced them and he didn't like them being smaller so he got them injected huge again. He said even though he can't breathe, he wants his nose to be smaller. Given that he brought this on himself, will keep having procedures after this, is atrocious with money and won't ever pay me back. Am I the jerk for refusing to gift him five figures from my down payment savings to have the surgery that will help him breathe better? Or do I owe him like he says? Well, what do you think? Should OP give her brother the money or not? Please let us know. Heck no, but how about to kick in the pants? Or in the nose? Take the money I give for bills and squander it? Hope you like the court system. I lived with a group of people who I thought were my friends. They were two couples and we all lived in the same house for almost two years until I recently moved out. There was David and Tina and Brittany and AJ. I was the only single person there. There was a debate on how we should pay the bills, but we all decided to give the money to the person whose name was on the bill. David paid the mortgage, Tina paid the water and electric slash gas, and I paid the internet. It came to the point where I was paying close to 80% of the mortgage by myself, the entire water bill, and about 75% of the gas and electric, and I was paying the internet bill by myself. I was giving the money still to the person in charge of the bill, but came to find out about 10 days before I moved out that the mortgage was defaulted on and the house was in foreclosure. Also, the water, gas, and electric bills were a constant threat of being shut off and that the only up-to-date bill was the internet. While they all saw me struggle to pay these off, they were mindlessly spending money during the day 
which is when I sleep due to working third shift, so I never saw the mindless things they spent money on, nor did I ever see the mail since they grabbed it before I woke up. Brittany never paid anything as she was having her check garnished due to unpaid student loans, but she always had expensive makeup. AJ never held a job for more than two weeks. David and Tina were always calling into work, knowing that I wouldn't allow them to go without a home due to our history. One day, I woke up while they were all out and about doing something or other, so I went to go check the mail as I was expecting a package when I saw the bills in the mail, so I decided to investigate. I opened up the gas and electric bill, as they are by the same company, to see a total amount of almost $400 and in risk of being shut off. I was shocked and upset. I knew right then and there what was going on, and I vowed to do them over as hard as I could. I had just interviewed for a new job that paid almost double what I was making, and I knew that I interviewed well with them, so I told myself that if I got the job, I would give them a 30-day notice and move out. And as it was close to the end of the month and I had already paid them, I would be moving out before the 1st of February. I got the call with the job offer the next day, which I happily accepted. I did the paperwork for the background check and it all came back clean. The same day I accepted the offer, I typed out a 30-day notice and recorded myself with my phone in my pocket, handing it to them, explaining that I was moving out. I started my job and my hunt for an apartment close to my new job, which I found within a week of starting. I took almost the entirety of my checks, set them aside for rent, deposit, and basic things that I would need. I was asked several times to help with the next month's bills, to which I said no, as I was saving for my own place and that they had plenty of time to come up with the money between the four of them, because I was doing it all by myself, pretty much on a meager pay rate of $11 an hour before my new job. There were a lot of scowls, passive-aggressive behavior, and flat-out attempts to take or use my things or foods without my permission. The day came when I finally went and got my U-Haul and had a few friends help me move. Free beer and free lunch are the best payment ever, as they shared it all with me. I was determined to get it all in one go, so I got the biggest one they had, and we got everything packed up. I took everything that was mine down to my pizza stone, which they loved my expensive kitchen knives, which they would use and never clean, even my toilet paper that I had bought three days prior to because I needed it. A few rolls went missing very quick. After moving everything, I sat down on my couch, looked around, my cat at my lap, and breathed a sigh of relief. I happened to be good friends with my previous neighbors and asked them to keep an eye out for anything out of the ordinary. Four days go by, and I come to find out that the gas, electric, and water have all been turned off and they were asking to fill up some buckets to manually flush the toilets, bathe in, etc. Now, both couples have dogs, which my cat hated as they were both hyperactive as heck, but I loved them. So I decided that those dogs were in a dangerous situation as they had no water, no heat in the middle of winter, and probably no food as I had bought the last bag about two weeks prior. I hate to see an animal hungry. So I called the local Humane Society and left an anonymous tip about the dogs and how I was worried about them. The next day, my neighbor, Todd, texted me telling me that the dogs were removed from the home, that my previous housemates were being charged with neglect, and because of the lack of utilities, that these were not civil but criminal charges. This was enough for me to smile, but I wanted more. I knew that David was divorced and had a kid. I also knew that he wasn't paying child support. I then contacted the local courts and made them aware of the flagrant non-support and that maybe they could help the agency looking for him. I provided the address that we lived at and the homeowner was the one who was being looked for. From there, it came to light that he was almost $25,000 behind, which is a felony in the state where I live. He's now living with someone on their couch as Tina left him. The house has been foreclosed on and he has nothing to his name while facing multiple criminal charges. Moral of the story, don't take advantage of a friend who knows all your dirty secrets. Karen gets instant karma for messing with a tree that isn't hers. So, some brief backstory is necessary to understand the direness of Karen's situation. Karen, along with her daughter, owns a house on our street. Seven other people, including me, live on this street. This street is somewhat private, although it isn't gated. It shares many resources and services that sets it apart from the rest of the community. Basically, it was originally empty land in the middle of an already existing neighborhood bought privately by a group who built houses and sold them. For these reasons, this street has an HOA representative, homeowners association, 
and they share things like lawn maintenance and street repair costs. For example, the street splits the cost for repairing stuff like street lights and people that mow the lawns do the entire street at a time. Karen and her daughter are rarely seen in this small street and they instead rent their house out to newcomers every few months or so. I've only seen them in person a few times since I moved here. On their most recent return a few days ago, they decided to have the tree in the front of their yard trimmed down before the next tenant arrives. Unfortunately, this tree belongs to the street and she has no jurisdiction tampering with it and she knew it. She made an attempt to call the HOA board and when they did not reply right away, she took the initiative to cut the tree to her desires. This morning, a group of workers came in a truck and loud power tools to cut several branches of this large tree. This dude came out first to complain and later came the old lady. They've both been living here for a long time and understand the rules clearly. The conversation was distant from my house, especially since I chose not to go outside and join the argument, but it went along the lines of the following. Dude. Hey, you can't cut that tree. Karen. Well, it's on my property. Dude. Actually, it's not. Tell them to stop cutting it. You need to contact the HOA first. I did, and they didn't respond, so it's not a big deal if I just trim it, okay? Old lady. Any change affects the value of the entire street and every house on it. You have to stop. Karen. Oh my god, it's just a tree. Give me a break, okay? For those that don't understand, the entire street sort of has a common theme to it where every house has a similar design, and each having a tree is part of said design. Stripping this mature tree down to a couple of branches completely ruins the look of the street. The dude walks up to the workers who are basically already finished. Guys, please stop for now. Karen steps in front of the dude. Hey, back off. The dude puts his hand on her shoulder to push her away. Stop being aggressive. This goes on for about 30 minutes. The entire time, Karen is being extremely rude, interrupting people and basically whining incessantly. The dude, the old lady, and the other neighbors watching knew they couldn't do anything without contacting the HOA first. They certainly didn't want to touch her and they couldn't do anything with the workers because they were hired by Karen. This entire time, her daughter didn't say anything and stood at the doorway of her house. The workers continued with the tree and in no time it was finished. About an hour passes when the dude and the old lady return with news from the HOA. It was true that Karen couldn't touch the tree and everyone knew that. But what Karen didn't know was that the consequences were extremely straightforward and relentless. When they began to explain to Karen her remaining options, she had a smirk of victory on her face, but it didn't take long for it to be completely wiped away. HOA policies dictate that she has to completely replace the tree which means that she needs to hire people to come dig the tree out, pay for a new tree, pay for it to be planted, and pay for the lawn that will be inevitably torn up as the tree is being replaced. If she does not comply, her house will be put on lean and be no longer considered an extension of our private street. For those that aren't fluent in real estate terms, this means that Karen cannot sell, rent, or refinance her property until said conditions are met. Even if she complies right away, her new tenant will be delayed for at least a week or more while the tree is being dug up. This is just such a sweet and fitting end to her entitled attitude. In total, she will be set back thousands of dollars for essentially nothing except lacking consideration of those around her. I'm not entirely clear on the costs, but I expect it to be at least $10,000. Moral of the story, don't mess around with trees. They have countless lawsuits and HOA strings attached to them. And don't be a jerk to your neighbors. Edit. I reread my post and decided that I didn't do as good a job as I wanted to explain why this Karen deserved her justice. I forgot to mention that she did flip everyone off and threatened to call a lawyer. She acted really childish overall and kept repeating the same phrase of something like, You can't touch me. I did nothing wrong. Over and over while interrupting people. Her daughter wasn't too much better, but you can't really blame her for trying to defend her mother a little bit. She probably just didn't understand what her mother really did. Her daughter was like, stop shouting, don't get aggressive, etc. I'd also like to mention that the trees, yes, trees, I realized after looking closer at her yard, she cut down were two cypress trees and a deciduous tree that grows red seeds and hard pods that I forgot the name of. The cypress trees she cut were towering and magnificent. She trimmed them down halfway and they will never regrow because both are at least 20 years old. Well, what do you think? Was it wrong of Karen to cut down the tree or not? Please let us know. Oh, how I love a good HOA story. The little old couple from heck. My hotel has had a lot of crazy happenings that I've shared before, but holy cow, this has to win an award for one of the most insane things to happen. 
First off, I want to say take a seat, grab a drink, a snack, maybe a beer, because holy cow, this is a long one. This little old couple, very well-mannered and seemingly just cheeky, came to check in mid-evening. The wife we'll call Karen and the man we'll call Ken. They were celebrating Karen's diagnosis as melanoma-free and decided to take a vacation to our property using Karen's membership points. They made a joke that I would get to know them by the end of their stay. Not wrong there and immediately asked where the bar was so they could get a few glasses of wine. They went out for dinner after scoping out the bar for about 10 minutes and come back a good two to three hours later. They ordered two glasses of Chardonnay, one glass per person, then sat down in the lobby, spending about 15 minutes on those glasses just chatting. I had a few check-ins and was standing at my front desk station around the corner from the bar when Karen started shouting, Waiter! Requesting another glass. Obviously, I'm not a waiter, and it's annoying when people act like we're a full service or I'm a dog, but nonetheless, I went and got them a second round. I'd say another 10 minutes passed before they asked for a second round. They started joking around about their marriage and being cheeky old people. I didn't think much of it. Going back to my pod and going back about 15 minutes later with their third round, they started getting really inappropriate around that time, so I told my coworker I was going to cut them off. On their fourth and final round, Ken blatantly states, we're thinking of getting it on tonight, and then proceeds to go on a big spout of nonsense which gets Karen pretty angry at him, telling him to shut up. I made sure to make them both aware they were not receiving any more drinks. About a good 20 minutes pass and my coworker, we'll call him B, and I were on the phones at the desk, working on two separate guest issues. I happened to turn around and saw Karen lying on the floor. I immediately went over to ask what happened and if she was okay. She laughingly explained she fell over one of the lobby chairs. B goes and grabs her a water before asking her if she needed medical assistance while I grabbed the hotel wheelchair. She declined assistance but accepted the wheelchair and out of instinct I handed B an incident report to get filled out as its corporate policy. Now Ken did not like the idea of his wife answering questions or filling out an incident form without his consent, like it's still the 50s or something. He starts yelling up a storm about Nobody talks to my wife but me. Or, we ain't signing no BS because we've done nothing wrong. Now, B, who had been understanding as heck and professional as could be, was understandably upset by Ken's ranting. Seeing the proverbial crap show about to go down, B starts giving Ken the verbal smackdown about, I will have the cops escort you and your stuff out if you do not keep a nice mouth around me. I opted to call the local non-emergency as a precaution. Boy, was I glad I did. Right as I get off the phone with the cops, Ken begins to go on the craziest rant of the century. He straight up grabs B and says, I bet you like that, don't you? To which B straight up hit his hand with the clipboard and declared we were going to have to ask them to leave as soon as the cops got here. B comes back to the desk while I'm calling corporate to report the issue and flag their account as a DNR. Ken's still going on his rant for a good 10 minutes. At this time, people are starting to come back from dinner and are passing through watching this old man screaming crazy things at B. While trying to hold B back, I notice that Karen's ankle is very swollen. She tries to get out of the chair while screaming at her husband to shut up and ends up falling again. B tries to go help her up, but Ken starts screaming at him to not come near them and tries to lift his wife himself, ending up falling on top of her. A guest passing through who's a retired firefighter came to help pick Karen up and put her back in the wheelchair. He advised we call fire rescue just as a precaution should either guest be hurt. I get on the phone to call 911 and tell them that the guest's ankle is very swollen. B decides to go over and ask if the injury was from the fall or not while alerting Karen that we called fire rescue anyway as a precaution. She blatantly states the swollen ankle was a pre-existing injury which I wrote down immediately on my own play-by-play -play witness report. Ken starts getting agitated with B asking questions and gets up, pushing B into the lobby column while shouting more craziness. B immediately walks away and says to call the cops again because Ken is now drunkenly coming towards the desk and screaming at us. I call 911 to cancel the paramedics and get the police out immediately, but the cops are stuck on a high priority call. Lo and behold, the paramedics still show up and thank God they did because honestly, they calmed Ken down with some light conversation and confirmed Karen was okay. Right behind the paramedics, an hour after calling, the police show up. They are the two most built female and male cops I've ever seen, like honestly, body goals. And thank God, because the nonsense that goes down next. Ken and Karen are upset because the cops are there. The cops are having none of that BS today. 
Karen gets out of the wheelchair and wobbles her way to the elevator, alongside Ken, who's glaring at B the entire way and still ranting. These two numbskulls don't press the floor button and end up back on all sorts of floors before finally getting off on the right one. I awkwardly ride in the elevator with the cops and lead them, and a stumbling Ken, to the room with a key. However, Karen's nowhere to be found, which makes everyone start panicking. Ken refuses to listen to the cops and takes off down the hallway, saying he needs to find Karen, and the cops now have to wrangle two drunk people while I stand there with the door open feeling useless as heck. They find Karen wandering back onto the elevator and went back down to the lobby, where B sent her back to the elevator and Ken was hiding in the stairwell. Finally, about 30 minutes into the cops being here, they get Ken and Karen into the room to start packing. Karen's starting to argue with Ken, saying it's his fault for convincing her to come to our hotel and she starts calling him names. She tries to push Ken into the sofa, which causes him to start yelling at her. The cops are at the end of their patience, telling them to get out or get arrested. Karen and Ken keep on stalling for a near 20 minutes before finally getting their stuff into the hallway. Around this time, Ken decides it's a great time to threaten a cop. Ken's got his back against another occupied room's door, banging on it with his fist and yelling, This is America! I can do whatever I want! To which the cop continues to say he will arrest Ken if he doesn't stop moving. The female officer starts to coax Ken towards the elevator and attempts to give them both a chance to comply. Karen starts following the female officer, but Ken grabs her by the shirt and starts yanking her back, dragging her across the floor. So you have them bumping into all of the guest room doors and walls, screaming, let go of me, and the cops shouting for Ken to let her go or get tased. The cops finally get Ken and Karen to the elevator. I decide to take the stairs and meet up with B at the front desk just in time for another officer to come in. B's speaking to that officer about pressing charges against Ken just to be interrupted by a screaming match in the corridor leading from the elevator to the lobby. Ken's starting up a screaming rant against the cops trying to grab a taser. The male cop grabs him and tries to cuff him, but this late 70s year old Ken is holding his own and it takes three cops to get him in cuffs and out the front door. On the way out, Ken shoves a girl with his shoulder, which then causes the girl's mom to start yelling and talking to the cops outside. Karen ends up wobbling into the lobby with the female cop and parks herself in a chair, where she then has the audacity to say, If I paid for the room, why can't I stay here? I had nothing to do with this mess. To which I proudly state, by state law, I'm refusing you service. About another hour passes. I get trespass letters for both guests from the local PD, and Karen again asks why she can't stay. The female cop has to repeat what I said in the layman's terms of, the managers want you to leave the property ASAP. Mind you, I was nice enough to find her lodging at a hotel down the street and called her a cab, so brownie points for me, I guess. By the time this show was over, it was 12.05 a.m., an hour past my shift's end time. B and myself stayed almost another hour writing reports and recalling every time possible. The most handwritten reports I've ever made. I'll update once I go in and see the amount of trouble or reward I'm in for. Update. I'm currently at work, not fired. My GM didn't even look at the report, but my AGM did praise B and I for our professionalism. Ken did try to come back to the property to get some shoes he left, ignoring the trespass letter and claiming he had no idea why he was arrested, to which my GM basically told him to get the heck out. Have you ever seen a Karen or a Ken get arrested? If so, what were they doing? Please let us know. It's been almost two months since I've been arrested. I can't wait till lockdown is over. Corrupt manager wants me to reject crucial supplies? Okay. About a couple of decades ago, I used to work at a concrete production plant for a reputable construction company. Our company, like several other construction companies, were awarded a portion of a larger project. A large portion of land was earmarked for setting up temporary office buildings and concrete plants for the different construction companies. The sites were separated by temporary barriers and had separate entrances. As many of you may or may not know, concrete is produced by mixing cement, water, sand, and stone grits, along with special admixtures in a specific ratio. Our recipe also contained a special ingredient, stone dust. Turns out, only our company used stone dust in our concrete and the neighbors did not. So a special truckload full of stone dust was specially shipped for us. This is important later. My job entailed orchestrating concrete delivery to our project sites apart from regular quality control tasks like checking incoming materials for quality, etc. Only after I had signed the delivery receipts, our store's personnel would unload the trucks at designated areas. A log of all trucks entering and leaving the concrete batching plant would be kept by security at gate, relevant later. 
Since my job entailed checking incoming material before accepting, the suppliers would usually try to offer some petty bribes, from cash to booze to flesh, if you know what I mean. I always decline such offers as once accepted. You become their dog and lose all respect in their eyes. Moreover, bad material also impacted the quality of concrete produced, strength, consistency, and setting time to name a few. Since concrete delivery was also part of my job, it was in my best interest to only accept good material. Otherwise, the client would chew me up during casting. One night, a supplier truck entered the premises with 20 millimeter stone chips. Upon testing, I found them to be undersized for 20 millimeters and oversized for 10 millimeters. I went ahead and rejected the load. The driver and supplier started pestering me, offering bribes and whatnot. When I didn't budge, they called my boss who asked me what was going on. I explained that the quality of the material was unacceptable and I have rejected this. When I mentioned it's too small for 20 millimeter, he ordered me to dump it in 10 millimeter bin anyway. I knew what that meant. My boss was on the supplier's payroll. A couple of weeks passed by and my boss asked me to reject a truckload of material from a very reliable supplier. He knew that the supplier was only delivering stone dust that day and should we reject material, the entire load would be a waste and a loss to the supplier. Once the stone chips or stone dust has left the quarry, they, for some reason, can't bring it back. Hence, my boss wanted to hit the supplier where it hurt most, especially stone dust, as there was no other company that would take it. Cue malicious compliance. I called the supplier, who would become a friend by now, and told him that I was under orders to reject a truck. He panicked and told me that my boss was putting pressure on him for bribes. This particular supplier believed in providing quality material and always visited my lab to understand how I tested the material and what my requirements were. He would then go back to his quarry and adjust the equipment to deliver the best quality materials. Because he put so much effort in improving the quality of his product, he did not budge and bow down to my boss's demands. I asked the supplier friend to route a truckload of 20 millimeter stone chips meant for some other company to my plant first. I would let the gate security log the truck's entry and then promptly reject the material. He was then supposed to send the stone dust, which I would accept and be done with my task. Everything happened as planned. I completed my remaining activities for the night and went home. When I came back to work in the evening, my boss was waiting for me at the door. As expected, he had checked the entry slash exit log as well as material receipt history. He had noticed that I had accepted the stone dust and was chewing his anger, waiting for me to explain. He very casually asked me if I had rejected a truckload. I acted dumb and answered an affirmation. I told him that the very first truck, a 20 millimeter, was rejected. Now, usually 20 millimeter is never rejected, especially from this supplier. So he asked me what reason did I give while rejecting the truckload. I said flakiness index, a test we never do as a field test, but is mandated by the client to be done once a quarter. He knew that I was playing him, but he couldn't do anything. I had done exactly what he had asked me to, reject a truckload. I had covered my bases with a security log as well as a material receipt, so he just muttered something under his breath and never mentioned this to me again or asked me to do anything similar. Two months later, he was transferred to a different site and I became the overall in charge. Same designation and pay, just more responsibilities. Am I the jerk for telling my brother he wasn't invited to support my friend because he's a creep? Since we were kids, my younger brother Kenny, 22, was super obnoxious and a bully. Think because my parents spoiled him too much, so he would get mean when other kids didn't want to do exactly what he wanted. So he had zero friends our entire childhood. When we were in high school, he was the odd guy nobody wanted to talk to because the way he'd behave and pull pranks. My parents forced me to bring him wherever I, 23, male, was going with my friends. Literally forced me. Like I would get grounded if I didn't. Everyone in my group hated him, especially my friend Sandra. Since 10th grade, Kenny had a crush on her. He'd buy her gifts or wait outside every one of her classes to talk to her. Every Valentine's Day, he'd send her those grams that they do at school and leave her notes about how they're going to spend their lives together. I told Kenny a million times to leave her alone and got my parents involved, but they never did anything. Sandra came out in our senior year and turned out she was already secretly going out with another girl in our class. Kenny was upset and kept asking her for a chance so maybe he could turn her back. By then, I kept Kenny away from her by lying to my parents about seeing my friends. Whenever I was forced to bring Kenny, we would tell her so she wouldn't show up because she'd say he scares her, which I felt really bad for. They haven't seen each other in years, but I'm still really close with her and everyone in our group. Sandra recently found out she has cancer and told us during a Zoom call. We all felt bad we couldn't be there for her because of lockdown, 
so we all decided we were going to drive by her apartment with we love you signs to show support. We let her wife know when we were going. We all parked outside her house, all inside our own cars of course, with our signs. She saw us from the window and took pics. She posted on Instagram and said she's grateful. I didn't know that Kenny followed her and he was really upset I didn't tell him so he could have gone to show his support too. I told him no way as he's the last person she'd want to see right now. He asked me why and I told him, cause you were a creep. I reminded him of everything he did and how much he made her uncomfortable so of course she wouldn't want to see him or him to know where she lives. He called me a jerk and hung up on me. My parents are saying he's upset and I need to apologize for hurting his feelings. My mom says I didn't have to say why he wasn't invited and could have said I forgot to tell him we were doing that instead of making him feel bad over a crush. This shouldn't even be a surprise to him because I always told him how creepy his behavior with her was since we were in high school, but I guess now it's a bad thing that I told him. They want me to apologize, but I don't think I should and it's turning into a whole thing. Just to be clear for my own peace of mind, was I the jerk for telling him this? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his brother Kenny? Please let us know. I could never even tell what Kenny was saying. That big jacket he wore made him sound muffled. Am I the jerk for not giving my son the PS4 we bought him for Christmas? I have a 14-year-old son, Junior. He's a pretty great kid who is normally very kind, helpful, and is just a joy. This year has been rough due to the state of the world, so my husband and I decided for Christmas we were going to update his phone and get him a PS4 Pro with a couple of games he really likes. We already have a few game systems, but he's been begging for a game system for his room that's solely his. We hid it with all of the kids' presents in our locked closet that the kids know not to go into because it has our gun safe, so major no-no in our home. A few nights ago, my husband and I went to the store, leaving the kids at home, and when we got home, Junior was mad. I asked him what was wrong, and he started going off about how he found the gifts. He was beyond angry that it was the four and not the five, and that the four was for losers. I told him he knew he wasn't to go in our closet, no idea how he got in, we have the key on our keychains, and that a game system was a privilege, not a right. He wasn't happy with this and said he didn't want a stupid PS4. I sent him to his room to calm down and grounded him. After some discussion with my husband and no attitude change over the next few days, we decided that he would no longer be getting it. We told Junior and he stormed off and called his grandparents. If you guessed I received an angry call, you would be 100% correct. My parents are furious with me. They think since I already bought it, I have no choice but to give it to him and teenagers are just moody. I told them our minds had already been made up, that we raised the kids better than this. I was called a horrible parent who doesn't care about my kids. Am I the jerk? Edit. Well guys, Junior has found my post and has came in, apologized, asked for a second chance and has asked if he can work for the PS4. He told me he used his school ID to get the door open because he knew the presents were in there. His dad and I are proud of him for apologizing and owning up to it, so he will be doing extra chores to earn his gift back. Well, what do you think? Should Junior still get the PS4 or not? Please let us know. I'd return the PS4 and just buy him an empty PS5 box instead. Imagine Junior's face on Christmas morning when he opens it. <laughs> yes. Oh, Karen, you are evil. Am I the jerk for being livid after my husband invited his whole family to celebrate Christmas at our house? I've been with my husband for four years. We've always celebrated Christmas at his parents' house. He never let me go celebrate with my family, even though his family lives in another town. He's always complained about wanting his family to come to us instead of going to them. His sister and her husband live near my in-laws and so they'd usually host a number of events and this upsets my husband for no reason. He says his brother-in-law isn't better than him and doesn't even have a big house to invite people there. Clearly, he's jealous of the time his family spends with his brother-in-law. A few days ago, he started calling his family a lot but didn't tell me why. He's been acting strange, spending his time making lists and buying stuff like blankets, cups, towels, even though it's just him, me, and our son. I kept asking him but he just said those were for us. He kept asking me to reschedule my shifts. I'm a nurse working in the local hospital and it's different from a clinic. It's always busy and requires more shifts. Yesterday, I got a call from my mother-in-law and she surprised me by saying that they decided to come on Tuesday. Her, father-in-law, sister-in-law, brother-in-law, and their kids, then my husband's aunt and her husband and stepkids will come on Friday. I was shocked. I had no idea what she was talking about. I was able to find out from her that my husband decided to invite his whole family for Christmas at our house. I didn't tell her that I didn't know. 
Once I finished the call, I went to ask my husband and he confirmed it. I was livid. This means they will be spending weeks at our house and cooking, cleaning, groceries will be taking up so much time. I have a strict schedule. I can't have any guests. He said they wanted this, but I doubted after he brought up how brother-in-law keeps inviting them. I told him to call and tell them we can't have them to our house and he refused. He said this will make him look bad and will upset them. He told me to calm down and think about it, but it's more people than I can handle. It's crazy. He said if brother-in-law has no issue inviting his family to his small place, then why can't we? I left the room and couldn't help but feel a lot of anger. I called my mom and she said it was better than having to go to them, but my house will be crowded and I will be so busy that I won't even be able to work shifts and earn money. Did I overreact here? Well, how would you feel if you were in OP's shoes? Please let us know. One giant head is enough around this house. We're never inviting your relatives, Mr. Reddit. Am I the jerk for telling my nieces that how they look is important and something that they should care about? This has caused such an uproar in my family and I feel like I'm going crazy over here. Like, don't come to Christmas uproar. About three weeks ago, I was babysitting my nieces. They're 9 and 11. I was playing dress up with them and the older one mentioned that she thought the game was silly because it doesn't matter what you look like, it's what's on the inside that counts. I told her that we didn't have to play anymore and asked her to tell me more about the it doesn't matter what you look like because I would like to learn. She happily told me all about how caring about your appearance is vain and people shouldn't care about what you wear, how much you weigh, what color your hair is, etc. That girls who are really into fashion or makeup had bad parents who should care more about making sure they're smart and do well in school. Then she asked me why I cared about these things like that because she always thought I was too smart for that. Maybe this is where I messed up, but I had to be honest with her. I told her that I care what I look like because I want to be respected by others. I want others to be attracted to me and that no matter what we tell ourselves, society does care and does judge men and women for how we look. I tried to explain that sometimes society cares too much, but that grooming ourselves, wearing well-fitting and clean clothes, etc. are things we should all care about. I also said that being interested in fashion and makeup doesn't make anyone less intelligent, that they're both ways of expressing ourselves and can be very artsy as well. 11-year-old seemed very bothered by this and told me that she couldn't believe I was one of them and then made a weird comment about how her mom said that's why I don't have any books. My sister called me furious about how I was poisoning them by forcing unobtainable beauty ideals on them. At no point did I say that they had to maintain a size 2 figure, shave, have long hair, spend thousands on designer clothes, etc. But she's making it out to seem like I babysat her kids and now they're destined to become Serena Vanderwoodsen. Am I the jerk here? My family sure as heck thinks I am. Well, who do you agree with? OP or her sister? Please let us know. You should really start caring what you look like, Mr. Reddit. You wear the same thing every day. It's disgusting. Am I the jerk for demanding my husband talk to a therapist after he typed the word boundaries like this? In case anyone isn't fluent in internet slang, the weird random capitalization means to read it in a whiny voice. My husband and I have been having some problems in regards to how he parents our 8-year-old son. My husband likes to play rough, tickling, wrestling, poking at someone after being told to stop, and my son is a quiet, introverted kid who hates that type of play. My husband also likes to do little pranks, mostly popping out and scaring people, but our son has asked him to stop. He also doesn't respect our son's limits in terms of social interaction. When we visit my in-laws, the house is very loud, the other kids play too hard, and our son does not enjoy it. He is asked to bring his switch and play upstairs. My husband said his mom would freak out over how rude that was, so I tried to compromise on a book. My husband said no and that it's his job to put him in uncomfortable decisions so he can grow. I think it hurts his feelings that our son doesn't like his grandparents, but I find them to be difficult to like, so I can't blame him. My in-laws have complained, not in front of him, that our son is too weak and wimpy and we are ruining him. I texted my husband the other day that I want to talk about our differences in parenting because I'm not okay with him continuing to disregard boundaries. He replied that he has been depressed lately because of how joyless me and our son are. And he wrote back, fine, we can talk about our boundaries. I said that he sounds just like his crappy parents and I'm not okay with that. I said he needs to talk to a therapist because I can't make him see how important boundaries are or maybe take parenting classes. Now he's really mad at me and feels like I'm saying he is totally horrible and the worst father. Well, who do you agree with? OP or her husband? Please let us know. Would I be the jerk if I told my mom to stop calling my money her money? 
I'm a 20-year-old man, and while I live at home, I am a full-time student on a full-ride scholarship. Because of how the scholarship is, I can't work too much or else they'll take the scholarship from me. And I'm currently out of a job because, one, lockdown, and two, my mom is autoimmune, so I can't work a physical job at the moment. I want to add that my mom is sweet and does a lot for me, and I don't want this to turn into dissing her or calling her a bad parent. It's just this money thing that's been rough. So my bank account is linked to hers, so she can add or withdraw money, and she can see every time I spend my money on anything. I also have a savings account and I'm really good about my money and don't spend nearly anything on myself. I got my stimulus check and split the money 60-40, 60% of my savings, 40% for myself. I also have money in my account from the previous job I worked. She has gifted me money for my birthday and Christmas before, but other than that, I don't ask her for money or anything else. Well, I decided to treat myself since my boyfriend gifted me his old gaming laptop and buy Minecraft on it, 26 bucks. Second thing I bought all year and the first thing I bought was for myself on my birthday. And as it's the holiday season, I commissioned some art for my boyfriend as a surprise, which was $35, $25 for the art and a $10 tip as I felt like the artist was undercharging and their work is really nice. So in total, I've spent $61 all year, $81 if you want to count my birthday gift. Later that day, I walk into the kitchen and she says, why are you spending money? I was really confused and explained I just bought a game and my boyfriend's Christmas gift. She laughs and says, all right, but don't go spending more of my money, okay? I just kind of smiled and mumbled out an okay and huddled back into my room. It really irked me as this isn't the first time she said something along the lines of my money belonging to her. When I worked at a job and spent money, she also said, stop spending my money. And when my boyfriend visited last year, she also made a comment on spending so much of her money. My grandma also sends money every Christmas and my mom has openly said she's taking her cut for my gift from her. Which like, okay, but ask before you take that. I'm fine sharing, just ask. I don't feel like my stimulus money is hers, you know? And it's not like she didn't get a stimulus check either. I don't want to be a jerk, it really annoys me when she acts entitled to my money. And if she needed the money, she knows all she has to do is ask and I'll help. I'll be an adult bringing it up, keep calm and cool, but I just want to know if I'd be a jerk for even bringing it up. This happened about a week ago and I don't know if it's too late to talk about it. Edit. Thank you for all of the responses. I really do appreciate the advice and shout out to the people who are going through similar situations and congrats on scholarships. Someone in the comments asked for clarification on a couple things. So, 1. I do not pay rent, but I have offered when I was 18 and when we moved again. My mom has refused both times as long as I keep my scholarships and keep up with school. I also help with yard work, moving things, anything she needs labor-wise whenever she asks. Should have clarified on the account. I'm attached to her account, not her attached to my account. I'm not sure if that changes much in regards to transferring money to a new private account. This joint account was made when I was 16. 3. Some people were worried that she has withdrawn money before. She is not, unless she's explicitly asked. I can also see how much she draws out when she does. Edit 2. I'm sure people will continue commenting on this for a while, but I got the groove. Currently working on setting up my own bank account and practicing what I'm going to say to my mom. I appreciate the concern and the feedback and thank y'all very much. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you say anything to your mom about how she's acting or not? Please let us know. My mom tried taking my money once. Last mistake she ever made before her untimely demise. <laughs> yes. Don't be a Karen if you don't want to look like a Karen. So I remembered a story of malicious compliance as recounted to me by a good friend of mine. My friend is a hairdresser by trade and works at a very upscale salon. I go to her myself and can attest to her being amazing. Anyway, this salon had one customer who had been passed around from hairdresser to hairdresser, bullying every single new one she saw. This woman was an absolute terror. She made three, count them, three separate hairdressers cry. The only reason she was still a client of the salon was that her mom was friends with the owner. She was a relatively young gal, maybe in her mid-twenties, with very long bottle blonde hair, past her waist, that she insisted to everyone who wasn't her hairdresser was her natural color. It was very much not. She went to the salon religiously so no one would ever find out her secret shame. She blamed her hairdresser for all of her hair problems, many of which were the results of heavy bleaching and how much heat she used on her hair and her refusal to follow care instructions and was never satisfied with anything. So everything shuts down in our state and she screams at my friend to come do her hair for her because she can't have her boyfriend finding out she's not a natural blonde. Anyway, 
My friend refuses, and despite Karen's threats, she knows that the salon owner knows she's too darn good at her job and has too loyal a customer base to fire her, so she thinks no more of it until a few months later when the salon reopens, and lo and behold, who should appear in the appointment book but Karen? So the day arrives, and Karen shows up with her hair dyed jet black, and not very well dyed either. My friend is shocked, because Karen's always made such a big deal about being a blonde, and how even though she gets her hair bleached, she really is a natural blonde and just enhancing her hair color a little. My friend asks Karen what they were doing that day and Karen demands to be made blonde again. My friend is like, uh, okay, that's going to be a process because this jerk has used black box dye, which is really hard to get out. For those of you who don't know, getting dyed dark hair to blonde is usually something done in stages, so the hair has a chance to recover a bit between bleaching sessions to avoid breakage. Karen is like, no, I am going to be blonde when I leave here today, or I am telling your boss that you see clients at home sometimes and getting you fired. My friend sometimes does friends hair at home for a lower price because she's a sweetheart, which her boss is fine with. And it's your fault I had to dye my own hair this color because my boyfriend would have seen my roots if I hadn't done something. My friend is tired of Karen's BS at this point, but it's a slow day and she has time. She explains to Karen that if she takes her blonde all in one go, her hair will be fried and she'll likely end up having to lose a lot of length. Karen scoffs and rolls her eyes and is like, that's never happened before and my hair is so healthy, I'm sure it will be fine if you don't mess it up. Friend recommends at least using Olaplex, a product that helps prevent damage. Karen says she thinks it's a scam to overcharge customers and won't pay for it. Cue malicious compliance. Friend is like, Okay, but make several coworkers be witnesses that this is what Karen is asking for after Friend explained the risks. Friend, meanwhile, has formulated a fiendish scheme. After that, Friend goes through the whole process of bleaching Karen's hair. She has to do it like four times or something, and she checks with Karen after each one that she's absolutely sure she has to be all the way back to champagne blonde by the end of the day and recommends stopping at some of the nice auburn or strawberry blonde shades in between for now. But Karen insists... Her boyfriend hates her hair anything but her natural blonde. My friend knows she will refuse because when has a Karen ever decided at the 11th hour to be reasonable? With each bleaching, there's more breakage and Karen's hair feels worse. My friend knows Karen's hair won't survive this, but Karen absolutely refuses to let her stop. Eventually, at long last, my friend manages to get Karen's hair to the required level and so she starts to rinse Karen's hair. It starts breaking off in her hand. The length of her hair is melted, fried, destroyed. My friend gets the bleach out and immediately conditions the ever-loving heck out of it while explaining to Karen that exactly what my friend said would happen has happened. Karen says she must be exaggerating and insists it's fine. Friend wraps what's left of Karen's hair in a towel and takes her back over to the station where she shows Karen the problem. Everything past a little bit beyond her chin length is pretty much gone. Karen shrieks and accuses my friend of everything under the sun. Incompetence, operating without a license. She most definitely has her license. A personal vendetta, etc, etc. My friend eventually calms her down and tells her she'll do her best to cut it so it looks decent for free. She even has the perfect cut in mind. It'll suit Karen perfectly. My friend gives Karen the sharpest, most beautifully cut angled bob you've ever seen. I've seen it thanks to my friend showing me Karen's Insta. That despite the incredible precision and skill showcased, is unequivocally and perfectly the Karen. Blown out and styled to, can I speak to your manager, perfection, Karen starts crying because the cut makes her look 40. She wants to speak to the manager. My friend gets the manager and Karen throws a fit, threatening to sue, and how dare they, and how his employees do this to mock her, and so on and so forth, while my friend stands there looking completely innocent. The boss then asks friend her side of the story, and the other hairdressers back her up, and say that the cut is just her trying to make the best of what's left of her hair. Even the boss by now is sick of Karen's BS, and Karen is forced to pay the huge sum of money owed for how much time was spent bleaching her hair, much of which is gone now, and leaves swearing never to come back. Her boyfriend, a cop, calls up later and threatens to assault my friend for doing that to Karen's hair against his wishes, and my friend tells him if he tries anything, she's going to tell his superiors and every news agency in the city. Nothing further happens, but he eventually dumps Karen because he doesn't like girls with short hair. Edit. Unfortunately, Karen's Karen S cannot be attributed to her boyfriend's influence. She was like that long before they got together. She had been going to that hair salon since she was a teenager. 
The older stylists who had been there a while told my friend stories of her antics and had always been a terror. I think this is more a case of birds of a feather than a girl scared into acting unreasonable. Have you ever dyed your hair before? And if so, what color? Please let us know. Craziest color wins a get out of jail free card. Entitled mom insists I change my dog's name to not confuse her son. This is so ridiculous and happened like 10 minutes ago. I couldn't walk home fast enough to get Wi-Fi and share this. Background info. I live in Argentina. I'm an advanced student in English teaching. I have four dogs and one of them is named Monkey. Before lockdown was enforced and made mandatory back in March, I used to tutor a kid who was five in English. He would be starting English classes at school this year and his mom, the entitled mom henceforth, had wanted him to have a head start in comparison to the other kids in his class. Entitled mom had said that kid was insecure about starting school and wanted him to feel accomplished and smart by being ahead of his classmates. Weird logic, but okay. She was paying me good money and the kid actually showed an interest in the language and all the activities I did with him. So tutoring him was actually enjoyable for both of us. When lockdown was enforced, we had to suspend the tutoring sessions because public transport was unavailable and they lived in the other corner of the city. Fast forward to today, I took my dog Monkey for a walk today and we ran into entitled mom and kid at the park and kid was thrilled to meet one of my dogs at last. I had talked to him about them before and showed him pics. He was very polite and asked what her name was and how old she was and if he could pet her etc. When I told him that my dog's name was Monkey, he was thrilled to let me know that he knew what that word meant because they had learned about different animals in his classes during the year. Entitled mom was less thrilled to know that I had named my dog as another animal. She started questioning me, although it felt more like interrogation, about why would I do that? If I did it just to show off my skills in English, if I was aware it could be confusing and so on. I asked her what she meant by confusing, thinking that she meant by the gender of the dog. I find it silly that people assume animals gender by their names, but it happens. But she said, and I'm quoting, Why would you try to confuse my son by naming a dog as another animal? He's trying hard to learn things in English because you prompted him to. And now whenever he hears the word monkey, he will think of your dog. I tried to explain to her why I had chosen that name for my dog, but she then went on about how I should change the dog's name to something more dog-like so kids like her son wouldn't feel confused about animals. She was very insistent on names I should call my dog, even telling her son to try calling Monkey other names to see if she responded. And I almost told her I could probably call her entitled mom's name instead because she's a jerk after all. No confusion there. But I restrained because her kid was there and I didn't want to deal with her getting all angry at me in public. Kid said he liked Monkey's name because it's unique and suits her because of her curly tail, like a monkey cartoon. And I told him it was actually one of the reasons I had chosen that name for her. Entitled Mom realized there was no win for her in this issue and quickly took her kid and left. Monkey and I actually shared a look for a moment and I took it as a cue to come home already. Edit to add, someone in the PMs asked me, aside from the curly tail, what other reasons I had to give Monkey that name. To be honest, when I brought her home, I was on a binge for anything Arctic Monkeys related for some reason. So there's also that. Also, I'm in love with all the comments sharing silly, funny, interesting pet names that they all know just fit perfectly. Do you have any pets? And if so, what are their names? Please let us know. You think that's bad? I've got a lizard named cat dog. Am I the jerk for wanting my son to be the ring bearer at my wedding? I'm male 29 and my fiance is female 28 and I are getting married next week. Don't worry, everybody is going to be required to get tested and we will be socially distanced with masks. My son, male 6, is from a previous relationship and I have 50-50 custody over him. Me and his mom are on friendly terms and she's okay with him going to my wedding. The problem is, my fiancé had told her niece, female 9, that she could be the flower girl. When my fiancé's nephew, male 8, found out, he became extremely upset and threw a fit. My sister-in-law demanded that her son be a ring bearer or she will not be attending the wedding. My fiancé is extremely close to her sister and was upset that she would not be coming to the wedding, so she also became upset and sided with her sister, stating in her words, This is my wedding and it happens by my terms or not at all. You can imagine how upset I was at that statement. I have a bit of a temper, so I left before this turned into a worse all-out screaming match. I'm unsure on what to do because I want my future wife to be happy at her wedding, but I don't believe excluding my son is a viable option. So Reddit, would I be the jerk if I told my wife that my son is going to be the ring bearer to my wedding no matter what her spoiled sister thinks? Edit, 
I've offered my sister-in-law to have her son as the second ring bearer, and she essentially laughed in my face and told me, If you're not going to make sacrifices to be part of our family, then you don't deserve to be marrying my sister. Edit 2. I'm going to have a talk with my fiancé tonight to determine if this is something we can move past or if this will be the end of our relationship, because I will make it abundantly clear that my son is the most important thing in my life, and if she does not respect, she will not be the stepmother to my child. For your information, the statement, this is my wedding and it happens by my terms or not at all, happened during an intense argument between me and her where I also said some questionable things, so I don't want her to be pictured as a completely unreasonable person. She also treats my son well and doesn't treat him or I horribly as some of you are suggesting. Update. First off, I want to say thank you to everyone who commented and messaged me. Your answers were insightful and helpful. Now on to the update. I've just finished having a conversation with my fiance. She was extremely distraught and crying as she felt horrible for the way she treated me and my son. She said that I would be better off without her. She said she had just been so stressed from the wedding and work that that night she lost it and she knows that is not an excuse. I explained to her that the way she treated my son was unacceptable and that for me to be confident in our relationship going forward, she needs to be absolutely sure that this would not happen again and I would like to uninvite her sister from the wedding. The only reason I feel comfortable with this is because she has been nothing but lovely to my kid. She agreed and now my son is the ring bearer and my best man, thanks to your suggestions, along with my brother. Her sister will not be attending our wedding and the niece will arrive with my fiancé's parents instead. I also had a conversation with my son without the presence of my girlfriend to know what he thought about her. He said, and I'm paraphrasing here, Lexi, my fiancé, is super pretty and nice and she makes really good chicken nuggets. I agree. My fiancé and my future in-laws have also decided to go no contact with my future sister-in-law due to what she tried to pull. Again, I would like to thank everyone who responded or DM'd me. Your support means a lot. Well, what would you have done in this situation? Would you have given in to the sister-in-law's demands or not? Please let us know. Hurry up and finish so I can go watch some Bridezilla. I'm really in the mood to binge on it now for some reason. It's past your checkout time and you have to leave. Okay. I work in a production facility that's heavily regulated by FDA rules and regulations. One of them is that anything that deviates from SOP has to be investigated. Strict deadlines have to be met and although extensions are allowed, it has to be due to unforeseen circumstances. I've worked here for close to 10 years and I have a unique position that only I do what I do. I do it well and need little if any oversight as long as I meet weekly goals. I also step in to help review investigations and route them in the system for closure when needed. I'm hourly and refuse to work from home since I'm not getting paid for it. Plus, home is family time. I like to track my work through email, so if something unusual is requested of me, I ask people to send me an email so I can make sure to do it. Cast. We've got me, and we've got the new associate supervisor as Jerk. P.S. Not my supervisor, but outranks me. Jerk. It's Friday and past your clock out time. What are you doing here? Me. Helping out a coworker who had to leave on time. Jerk. HR wants us to reduce overtime, and there's no reason why you should be here. Me. Don't worry about it. I'm sure my supervisor will address it if it's a problem. Jerk. You're just running the clock. As a supervisor, I know a lot of things that you guys are not aware of. I think you need to clock out and leave. Me. I'm waiting for an investigation to be signed off so I can close it. Well, your lack of planning does not constitute an emergency. Me. Do me a favor. Send me an email so I can put it on my to-do list. Fine. By the way, you will get nowhere in life if you need simple reminders for things like go home. Email read something to the effect of, due to recent HR directive, personnel are asked to reduce overtime hours. You are directed to leave within 15 minutes as per our conversation at 5.30 p.m. today. Me. Okay. Cue malicious compliance. I forwarded email to my supervisor and left. I get a frantic call Saturday asking me what the heck I was thinking having an investigation go overdue. I say jerk told me to leave. Please see email I forwarded you. I get a call back begging me to run in and close the investigation, which literally would have taken me less than five minutes, and that includes a quick email check. I say sure, but since rules are rules, I invoke call-in rules. Instead of one and a half my time, I get double pay for four hours minimum. My supervisor was ecstatic that I could go in, that she immediately said yes. Took my family with, had them sit in the car as I popped in, click, click, close, left and went for a nice family lunch. Jerk got written up, as is the rule for causing an investigation to go overdue, and it directly affected his raise and bonus. Oh, and he never talks to me. That alone is a huge win. 
What a jerk, right? Am I the jerk for accidentally leaving a pizza box in a friend's flat? So this is an incident that happened about 18 months ago that destroyed a long-term friendship. I've been thinking about it a lot and want to know if I'm the jerk. I played Dungeons and Dragons with my best friend, his wife, and a few other friends. We played in the conference room of a hotel, but sometimes had to play in their flat if the room was booked up. This happened around Christmas of 2018. Their flat was incredibly small and we struggled to fit everyone in. We ordered pizza and after I finished, I put my empty box under my seat to keep it out of the way. I accidentally forgot about it. I never had before. Next game night, we played in a storage area instead, which was much bigger and better. However, my friend said that his wife had banned us from playing in the flat because someone had left a pizza box after the last session. This was said in a jovial tone with a little hint of seriousness as if it were a joke. I suspected myself, but nothing was directed at me. It was said to the group as a whole. We all laughed about it and then moved on. The pizza box incident was never mentioned again. After this, his wife rarely came to the games. In February of 2019, I got engaged and organized a celebratory meal with friends, including best friend and his wife. I was going to ask best friend if he would be my best man. We heard nothing from them, so I messaged him to ask if they would be coming. Here is the message I got back, word for word with names redacted. We won't be coming. This may come as a shock, but me and my wife have just had a massive argument and I'm afraid it's over you. Ever since the day you put a pizza box on the floor in our flat and didn't apologize, it's been festering. She feels you have disrespected her and by doing so have also disrespected me. It's like you don't even care. It came to a head last week when you barely even acknowledged her. She's given me the ultimatum. It's either you or her. She's all I have left. After all we've been through, I cannot lose her. She isn't coming to the game anymore because she can't stand to be around you. This needs fixing. This was the first time the pizza box had been mentioned in four months. I was extremely apologetic, but best friend told me he didn't know how I could fix it. His wife refused to speak to me. I ended up writing a letter of apology. It was as nice and sincere as possible. There was a week of silence. My fiance messaged the wife about it, against my knowledge. She never replied and blocked my fiance. Eventually, best friend said they wouldn't forgive me. The letter of apology and message from my fiancé had upset his wife so much she was not sleeping at night. I sent a reply saying, in my eyes, accidentally leaving a pizza box on the floor isn't a huge deal, not enough to cause this drama. I also told him that if it was such a big issue, then someone should have talked to me about it. I said I was walking away from the situation and that he knew where I was if he ever needed me. I haven't heard a word from either of them since. Well, what do you think? Was OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. I think the pizza box was just an excuse. Something much darker and sinister is going on here. Am I the jerk for saying my life is tougher than my sister's, who is a stay-at-home mom? I, female 28, am unmarried, and my sister, Susan, female 37, is a stay-at-home mom to four kids, who are 13, 11, 10, and 7. We stay in different states. She chose to become a stay-at-home mom to her four kids voluntarily. My brother-in-law earns very well, and they have quite a comfortable life, if that detail matters. Susan has always complained about how tough her life is, how hard it is to bring up her four kids, and has compared it to my easy life. While it has always rubbed me the wrong way, I've never really said anything, because undoubtedly, it really must be hard bringing up four kids. Over the past few years, despite my parents, my other sister Lisa, and I living in the same state, Susan has always demanded we go to her place for Christmas because managing the kids is too hard, and being a mom is incredibly difficult. Last year, I even suggested a retreat that would have been equally distant for her and us, but she refused, saying it was just too hard and I wouldn't understand since I don't have kids and am not married. This year, she expects me to make the trip to her place again. Lock down anyone? I refused. I may not have four kids, but I have an extremely stressful job. I work about 60 hours a week, and I also do not have financial security that she does to even risk taking a few days off and have a significant amount of student debt to pay off. I studied abroad, but I'm earning in a local currency, so the gap is even harder to bridge. Also, Lisa has some health issues, and therefore, I'm the one who does her grocery shopping and such because it's unsafe for her to venture out now. When Susan demanded Lisa, my parents, and I would have to come to her place again this year for Christmas, not to mention I'll have to drive and pay for fuel, I point blank refused. She screamed at me and told me I'm selfish and that I'd never know the amount of work it takes to be a mother and that it was no surprise no guy wanted to marry me. I also lost my temper and told her it isn't an achievement to give birth to four kids 
that she doesn't have to worry about paying her rent or being able to afford her next meal, and there are plenty of life struggles that are tougher than having kids. Lisa is on my side, but she's always had a soft spot for me. My parents think I'm a huge jerk disrespecting Susan and are temporarily not speaking to me. So Reddit, I know it's hard to be a mom, but am I the jerk? We'll accept any judgment. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. I wouldn't be going to the house anyway. Susan sounds like quite the Karen. Karen dumps cookies on the floor, gets forced to clean up after herself. The grocery store I work at instituted a policy that lets us stay open an hour later for medical professionals and emergency services. You know, nurses and the people who respond to 911 calls. We close to the general public at 9 and from 9 to 10 is supposed to be a time for the aforementioned people to come in and shop unobstructed. Also thought I'd mention that we open an hour early for senior citizens. Unfortunately, Karen had her own interpretation of this policy. We've got me. We've got entitled mom, Karen, typical haircut, mid-30s. We've got the manager, 6 foot 5, easily 300 pounds, West African immigrant, not the type of guy you want to mess around with. It was 9.45 p.m., 15 minutes until close, and I was restocking eggs when Entitled Mom pushed her cart, filled to the brim with groceries. Her newborn baby was sitting in a car seat in the front of the cart. Entitled Mom. Ahem. <laughs> Me. Hello, ma'am. How can I help you? Where are the cookies? They're in aisle 12. Would you like me to take you to them? Yes, that would be good. Since aisle 12 is pretty far from the eggs, I decided to make some small talk, since we were trained to do that. Me. I think it's really great what you guys do for society. Entitled Mom. Thanks. So, you are a nurse? Oh no, I'm a mom. Moms are the most essential workers, wouldn't you think? We weren't allowed to call people out for not being an EMT or something, so I agreed. We got to aisle 12, and she started taking cookies down from the shelf and putting them in her cart. As she was walking away from the shelf, she bumped it with her cart and the entire shelf of cookies fell down. I had spent an entire hour leveling that shelf and now all of my efforts were gone. And instead of apologizing and helping clean up, she said, Oops, I'd help, but I have to get going. My kids are waiting at home and just walked away. Just to clarify, the shelf itself didn't fall down, but all the cookies did. I knelt in front of the pile of cookies, defeated. I started putting the cookies back up as her cart squeaked away. I would have gone after her, but my store is very committed to the whole, the customer is always right thing. I started putting the cookies back up, which would honestly take another hour and a half because of the sheer amount of cookies on the floor. About 15 minutes in, my manager comes by and freaks out about the cookies, but then he realizes, TFLJ Martis wouldn't just knock down all the cookies, right? So he asked me, what happened? Me. Some lady bumped her cart into the shelf and everything fell down. Manager. What? Me. Yeah, so I'm cleaning it up. Don't worry, I'll be fast. Manager. Oh, heck no. Where did she go? Me. Down the aisle. He took off. Like sprinting. I didn't follow him because I wanted to finish the cookies before my shift ended. So the following interaction is secondhand from one of the cashiers. He managed to catch her going out the doors with her cart full of groceries. This was about 10.05 now, past close. Manager. Hey, you. Yes? My stalker tells me you made a mess in my cookie aisle. Why? I don't know what you mean. I wasn't even in the cookie aisle. Manager. I can see the cookies in your cart. Um, I'm sorry? I need to go. I'm an essential worker. Manager. What kind of worker? A mom. Manager. My mother, back in Nigeria, she worked 12 hours a day after my father passed, and she still had time afterwards to clean up her messes. Entitled mom. No, really, I have to go. Manager. Go clean up the cookies. But who will watch my baby and my groceries? You can bring it with you, so your baby can learn how to take care of his own messes. Entitled mom reluctantly goes with manager and comes over to the cookie aisle where I'm still slaving away. Manager. TFLJ Martis, get up. Me. Okay. Manager, turning to Entitled Mom. Now clean up the mess. It took her until about 10.45, but it would have been a lot longer if Manager hadn't felt sorry for her, and so he and I started helping her. 
At the end, she apologized to me and manager, and she actually paid for some of the broken packages. We helped her take her groceries to her car, where she apologized profusely again. I'm happy there was actually a good ending to this, and Karen ended up learning her lesson and apologized. I just wish it was like this for every Karen. My Karen girlfriend found out my parents are rich. Now she's mad I won't pay her medical and college debt. My family is low-key wealthy, but my parents have made sure that we are never flashy about it. We live in the same place we've lived for about 15 years, don't have flashy clothes and cars, and generally make sure we're spending money on experiences rather than objects. Cue my younger sister, who's totally spoiled and for some reason feels extremely entitled to her share of the wealth. She just turned 21, and I think part of it is her finally getting information about her trust and in general how we stand. I'm 25 and I'm the older one, so I've sort of known about all of this for a while now. Anyway, long story short, my sister ended up going car shopping with my girlfriend for expensive new cars, Porsches. My dad has not approved anything, so I don't know what she's going to do, but apparently she flashed my dad's credit card and talked up the salesman about how much money she has to spend. My girlfriend was shocked that me driving a simple, unassuming 10-year-old Lexus will have a sister throwing $100,000 at a car. We had a huge discussion and ended up fighting about it. She was shocked at roughly how much money we had and told me I was a tad selfish for not mentioning it when she had college and medical debt. Honestly, we've only been dating for two years, and I was thinking after about a year I would propose if things are going well and start this discussion. It's all happened a little too soon. I'm really mad at my sister and kind of laid it out on her. Told her how immature and selfish she was and how she is undoing everything our parents have worked hard for to install values in us. She told me I had to grow up and I'm a wet blanket. Am I the jerk here? Not the jerk. The biggest jerk here is your girlfriend for assuming that because you come from a wealthy family, you're obligated to pay off her debt. Is this really the kind of person that you want to have a relationship with? OP. Yeah, that kind of caught me off guard. Your parents' money has nothing and will never have anything to do with her college and medical debt. That was a strange thing for her to say. I don't get why people would be mad at not being told about wealth. Are they equally as mad about not being told of a family debt? I'm blown away that she thinks she's entitled to it. I was thinking the same. It's telling that the fact that her knowing that you have access to money equals her debt being paid. The only reason you should disclose an aspect of your finances with anyone is if they are contributing to them, for business purposes or because you are combining household finances. Why would she need to know how much money you have? I get why people would be upset after learning that their significant other had been hiding something from them for two years. That would make me wonder, what else are they hiding from me? But the key here is that isn't what the girlfriend wondered. Her mind went straight to, why hasn't this benefited me? And that's the issue, and it makes her a massive jerk. Sorry, she wants you to pay off her debt? Just because your family is wealthy? The audacity and entitlement she has. Not the jerk OP. Yours and your family's finances are really none of her business unless y'all get married. OP. Yeah, but I guess if my parents are okay, they are not. With my sister spending $100,000 on a car, her $20,000 medical debt seems quite small. But your girlfriend is not your parents' kid or their responsibility. Yeah, it sucks for your girlfriend and your sister sounds spoiled. But your girlfriend isn't their family and they're under no obligation to take care of her. I would never throw a fit over my wealthy boyfriend not paying my debt. Especially if it's only been two years and y'all aren't even engaged. And like you said, your parents aren't okay with your sister buying that expensive car. Why would they be okay dropping thousands on someone who's not their priority? Honestly, I can kind of relate to the girlfriend here. She's still the jerk and I hope she will realize that her reaction was wrong. But I also was a bit blindsided when I found out how much money my boyfriend has. Mind you, nowhere near what OP has, just decent savings. If you're worrying about every dime you spend, grew up with money problems, and so many of your problems could be fixed with money, it can make you upset to see someone else who doesn't have to worry about any of that stuff. Red flag that she mentions her medical debt. OP. It's not much, about 20000 that she's paying off. 20000 is that much to most people. OP. Which is sort of her point. 20000 is life-changing money to most people. You will do as you want with this relationship, 
But I think what we're seeing here is she wasn't upset that you didn't trust her enough to tell her in the past two years you've been together, but rather that hearing immediately went to you paying for her debt. The first reaction would be understandable. After two years, suddenly, finding out from a third party that you're wealthy would be a lot to take in. However, her mind seemed to immediately go to, why aren't you paying my way? This is not the reaction you should want. No, no, it's a problem. It's a problem that your girlfriend of not long enough heard that you had money and her first thought was how selfish you are because you aren't taking care of her debt and bills. That is exactly why you don't tell people you have money. Your sister is going to get really done over by the wrong person one day and she's going to learn to stop bragging to everyone about the money she has. Not the jerk. You aren't married and pooling assets together. She had no reason to know. That's your business that you choose to share with people for obvious reasons. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. You know, if I ever become rich, I don't think I'm going to tell anyone about it. Am I the jerk for extending my vacation with my family and missing my girlfriend's surgery? I think she's being dramatic. I, 35 male, have been with Stacy, 33 female, for 8 years. Neither of us want marriage, but we are committed long term to our relationship. Stacy gets tonsillitis 3 to 4 times per year and has swollen turbinates, which means she is in agony every quarter and has trouble breathing through her nose. She is having a tonsillectomy and turbinate reduction surgery at the same time. Both are done through GA and she'll be there for 24 to 36 hours. We get to pick the surgery date to fit around my work schedule. I had a big project coming up and it was due to finish a few days before her surgery. I organized to take the week off work to keep her company, help prep food, etc. I thought it was the least I could do since she claimed to need someone there. We recently moved to a new state, so neither of us have family or friends in town. Project fell through, so I booked a flight to surprise my family and would be there for four and a half weeks. Return flight would have me there the day after surgery. Since the trip was a surprise for my family, nobody took time off work and I've barely seen them. Sister managed to get time off during week five, so I extended my trip to stay. Stacy was upset and asked me to come home when originally planned. I had my tonsils out when I was eight and I was at school a week later. I don't think she'll need someone there because it's as simple as taking painkillers and reheating soup. However, she says that her doctor said she'd need someone with her for at least the first three days and because I knew about the date already that somehow I'm being insensitive. She said that I should have warned my family to make sure they took time off, but that wouldn't have been a surprise. My sister says she's being selfish because she's coming between me and my family time and I'm on the same side. I googled anecdotes of tonsillectomy recovery but I know people often exaggerate online for attention. Now her mother has called me and, nicely I'll admit, asked me to come back to look after Stacy since she'll have no one else. Am I the jerk? ETA. Our friends are also divided on this issue. ETA. Full disclosure, it was my brother I was referring to. I changed it to sister to make it a bit anonymous, but I ended up telling my girlfriend I posted here, so it doesn't matter so much anymore. You're the jerk. Let me count the ways. 1. Surprising your family was more important than actually spending time and making plans with them. 2. Specifically telling your significant other you would be back in time and changing last minute to ensure she will be alone and have no time to see if anyone else could come help her. 3. Making a commitment to help her and then blaming her for coming between you and your family. 4. Thinking kids healing from surgery is the same as an adult. Spoiler alert, it isn't. It's much harder for adults and I guarantee you weren't taking care of yourself at the age of 8 like you think she should. 5. Her doctor is specifically saying that she needs somebody to help her for the first 3 days and you think she's being dramatic. You suck. Be better. He also decided to surprise them for 4 and a half weeks, which I guess means he hangs out alone at their house eating snacks while they are at work. No thanks. Hope the poor girl reconsiders living with someone like this. He has no respect for her, like simple, take some painkiller and reheated soup. What? She doesn't deserve this treatment, and sister is supporting him, telling him that his girlfriend is paranoid? You're the jerk. She deserves happiness. Next post. Am I the jerk for leaving my pregnant girlfriend in the hospital? My sister told me it was okay. Doctors would take care of the baby. You're the jerk. That was the part that got me too. Painkillers and reheated soup? What's wrong with this dude? You're the jerk massively. You didn't plan your trip or tell your family, which is why it needs to be extended in the first place. 
You prioritized a trip over your partner in great pain. You flipped out on your original plan without consulting her, even though she still needs surgery. You dismissed and minimized her pain. Tonsillectomy and turbinate reduction is a major surgery for an adult. You consider your opinion on her surgery superior to hers or even her doctor's. You want to abandon your recovering and in pain girlfriend when she needs you the most. You chose not to be back on time, not even early, for her when she has to schedule a major part of her life around you. You tried to find something about the surgery online, but only to fit your selfish narrative, hence the people exaggerate for attention part. Wow, that's a lot. You're a jerk, and so is everyone who's supporting you. Why, after you planned to take care of Stacy, did you think that abandoning her was a good idea? Do you consider your support a favor to her? Because if yes, I hope she dumps you. You sound like a terrible, inconsiderate partner who doesn't respect Stacy, her pain, or her plans. Well, who do you agree with? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. 1400 packages of cookies. I broke a rewards program. The year was 2000 in Canada. One of the better grocery store chains, Loblaws, had introduced their new President's Choice PC Points Rewards program. This was tied into their PC Financial MasterCard. There was a month-long promotion where you could get bonus points for purchasing select items. One of the items was their signature President's Choice Decadent Chocolate Chip Cookies. These are amazing cookies that are still around today. The offer was, for every bag of cookies purchased for the regular price of $1.99, you got 1,000 PC points when you used your PC Financial MasterCard. That 1,000 PC points was worth $1 for a later redemption. Buying a package of great cookies for half price after reward value would not make for a good malicious compliance story, now would it? I figured something out and started some major malicious compliance with their offer. I started by going from store to store and buying every bag of cookies I could find. I even asked if they had cases in the back. From one store, I was able to get 8 cases. I ended up getting 1400 packages of cookies over a 3 week period before the program broke. Having 1,400 packages of cookies created a problem. What was I going to do with all those cookies I bought for $1.99? At the time, I was a field sales rep for a company with four factories in the province. I ended up selling most of the cookies for $1 a package to the employees. They thought it was a great deal and could not get enough. On to the points. Every couple of days, the bonus points would show up in my PC points account. I realized I could take my PC points and convert them online from PC points to Petro points, Petro Canada gas station rewards program. Once I had 100,000 PC points, I would convert to 100,000 Petro points. I would then go online into my Petro points account and convert those points to Sears Club points. Sears was a department store that is now gone. Eventually, I would redeem the Sears Club points for vouchers that could be used for in-store purchases at Sears. The break. After converting 1,400,000 PC financial points to Petro points over a couple of weeks, Petro Canada caught on and immediately stopped all conversions to Sears for everyone. No more points could be converted. It was even marked as not available on their website. I called Petro points when I found out, and after a little discussion regarding the sudden end of the conversions, was allowed one final conversion. The math. One package of cookies cost $1.99. I sold the packages of cookies for $1, earned $1 in PC points, exchanged that $1 in PC points to $1 in Petro points, exchanged the $1 in Petro points to $5 in Sears Club points. It was a fun three weeks while it lasted. I told my sister I'm not surprised she doesn't have any friends. So I recently moved to my home country for college and recently found out my 10 year old sister did something that I'm pretty upset about. So my family had a party for me before I left and near the end, I noticed that my Nintendo Switch and its games were gone. I found it in my sister's room and packed it and went to sleep to get ready to go to the airport. The flight and everything else went fine, and while I was unpacking my stuff, I noticed I couldn't find my Nintendo Switch or any of its games. I was really confused as I distinctly remembered putting it in my suitcase. I called my mom and she explained that my sister had taken the games and my Switch in the middle of the night and hid it so that she could have it. My mom didn't know until it was too late and just grounded my sister from candy for a week. I am fuming. The switch was given to me by a friend and all the games were either gifts or I paid for them and now my mom thinks it's completely okay to let my sister take something that's mine. When I told her this, she said I was being melodramatic 
and territorial and to let my sister have it. The next week, my sister called me and was being a jerk about the whole thing, saying stuff like, how does it feel to know you have to ask me to play games now? I told her that she is an entitled brat and told her, I'm not surprised you still don't have a friend. My sister was shocked and hung up the phone. She's been having trouble making friends for a while now and told me that I'm the jerk. I'll admit I went too far, but I don't disagree with calling her out on doing that. My sister has never done anything like this and my siblings and parents are telling me that I'm the jerk now and telling me to apologize and let her keep it. I'm conflicted and need to know if I'm in the wrong because I feel bad and need to know if I'm the entitled brat. So, am I the jerk? Edit. My entire family isn't letting me talk to her until I say that it belongs to her. Thank you all for the support. I now realize I've been manipulated, gaslighted, and emotionally mistreated by my entire family for years. I'll make an update post on what happens, and yes, I am involving the police. I can't tell you all how grateful I am to finally grow a spine and stop making excuses for their toxic BS. Thank you all. Update. Well, the basic rundown is that my sister apologized after Joy, my cousin, told her what she did was wrong and forgave me and gave my stuff to Joy to mail it back. I reported theft to the police. My entire family has been calling me and Joy names and screaming at us through calls, so it's no contact for both of us. I'll try to keep you all updated on what happens next. Wait, your sister effectively steals your switch, phones you to brag about said theft, and somehow your mother thinks you're the jerk for snapping back? Yeah, no, that's not how this works. No wonder your sister is struggling to make friends. Hard, not the jerk. Yeah, that's what I'm also thinking. OP's sister stole from OP and mom was like, I didn't give her any candy, she's just a kid, leave it alone. What's wrong with her? Correct their mistake. OP's sister doesn't have any remorse about her actions. I also agree with not the jerk. Am I the jerk for making my daughter sit in her room while the rest of us have snacks? I work 14 hour days on Saturdays, so I picked up food on my way home so I don't have to cook and so pick up snacks for the kids too. Usually sweet treats that last them all week. Every Friday I ask what they want. My two younger kids who are 10 and 7 give me their list. My daughter, however, 14, always tells me she doesn't want anything. She has all of Friday and can message me at work all of Saturday if she changes her mind. Every week, like clockwork, she insists she doesn't want anything, multiple times, and then every week she'll huff and start crying because she doesn't have anything. My 10-year-old is really sweet and will instead give her his, so he doesn't have anything for the rest of the week. He will then end up sharing with his younger sister. This upsets me. No matter what I do punishment-wise, she won't quit her behavior. She will cry incessantly and claim I'm favoring them. Both kids get really upset whenever anyone cries, so it's just a cycle. Last Saturday, she started again. I'd had a particularly stressful day and said she could either shut up or put up or take herself to her room. She continued to whine, so I marched her to her room. She was pretty shocked, but stopped crying. My younger two and I ate our snacks. They were initially kind of upset, but after I explained a little, they were happy to eat. My wife was upset, but didn't say anything. Every night after I get in, we have our sweet treat. Every night, oldest starts whining, and so I send her to her room. Today, my wife blew up at me over it, saying she has a right to be upset, and that I should just buy her snacks anyway, rather than forcefully single her out each night. I disagree. She's a big girl. She can ask for snacks if she wants them, not manipulate her younger brother into giving his up. Overall, it's created a huge rift. I will admit her behavior has been much, much better this week, but I'm now thinking she may just be hiding from me rather than behaving. I don't know if I went too far with it or not. So, am I the jerk? Not the jerk. She's old enough to tell you what she wants, and she shouldn't just take snacks from her younger siblings. OP. That's what I'm thinking, but I'm still unsure with the backlash I've received. Have you asked her why she keeps refusing? Probably because she's self-conscious about eating junk food, like many girls her age, and is handling it badly by pretending to herself she doesn't want this stuff. Then she craves it when everyone else is having some. It's not that unusual or deep. I do what wife said and just buy extra snacks each week. With kids, you have to pick your battles. If she is otherwise a good kid who knows how to advocate for herself, why make this into a thing? Not the jerk. Because you warned her and asked what she wanted, but now that you've made your point, you need to start to let this go. 
My 14-year-old son does this exact same thing. We drive an hour each way to visit my mother most Sundays. Sometimes we will stop and eat a sit-down meal on the way back. But if I'm extra tired, we will just swing through a drive through fast food place. Anytime we go through a drive through he always says the same thing. He's fine and doesn't want anything. I mean always. It's annoying because I know that once he smells the french fries or sees the frosty, he will end up wanting it. And then I'll end up giving mine away. Because, you know, that's what moms do. So I simply don't ask him anymore. I got tired of the cycle. We just buy him whatever I think he's going to want and he's going to be happy with it. There's only been once or twice that part of his meal doesn't get eaten, so we aren't wasting food or throwing away money. Just accept that your daughter is going through a phase, and as long as she's well behaved for everything else, don't let this little thing turn into a huge conflict. This Saturday, just pick her up a treat for the week, no matter if she asks for one or not. Kids aren't mature enough to always wisely pick and choose their battles, so sometimes we just gotta do it for them. You've made your point, so now move on. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his daughter? Please let us know. Most importantly of all, are we talking about hostess snacks or little Debbie's? Am I the jerk for demanding my friend pay to clean my house? Here I am with probably the most disgusting am I the jerk I've ever heard of. It's winter and so we have a humidifier going on in the living room. I had a friend with her 11 year old over. He wanted to watch a movie so I put on Disney Plus and his mom and I went to talk in the kitchen. We ended up stepping outside so I could show her what my plans were for our garden this spring. She's really into homesteading and had great advice. When we were done, we went back in the house and eventually went back to the living room. It smelled really weird in there and I have a very sensitive nose. It kind of smelled like pee, so I wondered if my cats had peed in there somewhere, but they were all in hiding because we had people over. It really bothered me and I kept inve <laughs> I kept invest- and I kept investigating before I realized the blue water holders of the humidifier were green. I pulled it out and it smelled like pee. I was talking out loud while doing all of this and her son was basically like, Yeah, I peed in that. I think it's really cool how it makes my pee just disappear. To which I immediately wanted to throw up. I was stunned and so disgusted and the mom was like shocked. She excused herself and her and her kid left. It turns out he has a humidifier in his room to help with his chapped lips and dry nose and he's been using it as a toilet for months. I threw my humidifier away and realized I never wanted to go into my living room again because it stinks all over the room. The mom asked if there was anything she could do to make it up to me and offered to buy me a new humidifier but I said I'm fine with just never owning another humidifier but I would really appreciate it if she could split with me or pay for the cost to have my living room professionally clean. I want the carpet, sofa, and drapes steamed clean, the wall clean, and every nook and cranny cleaned. The idea of even walking into my living room makes my skin crawl. She said that was too much and she can just buy me a new humidifier. She didn't plan on doing any cleaning to her son's room. She kind of sees it as a non-issue. I'm so disgusted, but I feel like she should at least split the cost of the professional cleaning. She's refusing and calling me the jerk for trying to take advantage of the situation to get my living room cleaned. We're kind of in a standoff and I'm wondering if I'm being the jerk here. Is this really asking for too much? Not the jerk. Splitting the cleaning cost, assuming it wouldn't cost this friend more than $1 to $200, seems pretty reasonable to me, especially when you're not asking for the humidifier to be replaced. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.